Today we have uh, two of the top indie performers here in the world, Kevin Steen and David Richards. Uh, we created a bit of a controversy last year because both of these guys individually sat down with us and uh, did their own this shoot guy. interviews. This guy. <laughs> and uh, unlike most shoot interviews, you know, it got a little personal there and uh, we wanted to kind of bring the two of them back, uh, first of all, to kind of like sum up what happened in those interviews, where they were at. I know both of you guys have talked to each other since then and, and you know, mended the fences. And then we, we talked before I did mine, actually. Before? Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I remember uh, we had your interview first, and you, I don't remember the specifics of it, but you were in a weird place that day. And you yeah. Were, you were really open. Do you remember? Weren't you in a corner of the ring or something? Not oh, you mean, there. like, in his life. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> this is over. We love each other. Dave, do you remember, uh, well, you know, you, you were kind of, uh, I don't know, bitter might be one word to use. But yeah, you, no, it's absolutely true. Uh, very frustrating. Um, not with Kevin. Um, a little bit. No, no, because I'd tell you personally if I was with you. Uh, <clears throat> with Ring of Honor, uh, and it was the, during the period of time where the, uh, the whole, I was torn between Ring of Honor and New Japan and, you know, I couldn't win one for the other, and, and then the whole Iowa thing happened. I felt really disrespected, and uh, that was kind of just me. Uh, to be honest, that was a that was a starting point of me kind of understanding that I don't I don't have a place uh, in that company anymore. And and, and I vented on Kevin. And uh, but which, the uh, Iowa thing happened after. Huh? The Iowa thing happened after your interview. Oh, is that after? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I just all I see is this big span of time where it was like one thing after another. <clears throat> um, but it it, was it did t- happen, but uh, the Iowa thing might have, in some ways, been uh, you know part of your mentality. What happened in Iowa? I know you talked about it online. But yeah, what- no, yeah. So we we got booked, me, Tony, and Kyle, and a couple students, but there's kind of extras, and we went up there and yeah, we did these shows for this guy and the other guy. And we did this seminar for the guy, we, and we go to the show, <clears throat> and then Tony got hurt that night, and it was a six-hour drive from the Saturday show to the Sunday show, and we called this guy, and just some random guy running the show, you know, it wasn't even Jason Strife, it was just one of his students, and, um, and uh, hey, is there a way we can turn this to a six-man tag, we'll work for cheaper, whatever you need to do, if you don't want us to, no problem, and, uh, we found out later what happened is the guy looked down. He thought he was going to draw these huge numbers because he had the you know Ring of Honor guy on there and whatnot. And he looked out there and it was still his normal crowd, which was like 25 people, and he was going to lose his butt big time. And so he's like, "Oh, if he's hurt, then you know what? Just don't show up. You guys can't wrestle. Don't worry about it." And like you know, we're we're more than six hours from home, so we have to drive from uh, near Kansas back here then down. They were like, dude, we can't climb all the way up here and you not pay us. It doesn't work like that, dude. We'll work the singles matches trying to help out Tony because, you know, Tony, God love him, is old and not in the best shape of his entire life and getting hurt and I'm quite scared for his health. But regardless, you know, it's fine. So he tried to cancel on us and uh, and I, mean, I vividly remember the thing that pissed me off and, and I'll be the first to admit that, you know, like, uh, I have a short fuse, uh, is that Tony says, uh, "We do. You just can't cancel on us, man. You can't do that." And the guy goes, "I just did," and hung up on him, which pissed me off. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and Tony has a problem with confrontation. I don't. Uh, so I went there, and we get there, and we get there, okay, you're gonna give us our money right now, okay? This is bullshit. This is not gonna happen like this. Sorry if I can't cuss on this. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be a curse. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, but uh, I might so uh, I got his money. I was like, let's get in the car. Let's go. And we left. You know what I mean? I came home. I'm thinking about it. Two days later, I sent him the money back. And I said, this is all about principle. Now you know what it feels like to be screwed and to feel helpless. You know, so you can learn. You respect people in this business and you like, love a pure word. You know, I never wanted your money. I don't need your money. You know, it was $300. I don't care. You know what I mean? I don't need it. And uh, but it was principle, you know. And that's the way, I, and that's why I was brought. In. That's what Orndorff taught me in wrestling. That's that's what I believe in. You know, you, you don't. If someone's done more than you. You go just disrespect people. That's not the way it happens. And if you do, there needs to be ramifications. That's the way real life works. And, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what I did. You know. Uh, so that was the Iowa situation. What would what would you have done differently now that you've had some time? You're not so hot headed now about as it. far the Iowa thing. Yeah. Nothing. Really? Nothing. No. Nothing. Kevin, you, do you do you think everything he did was right? What do you think? I think uh, doing that video with your student and Tony after making fun of it and calling yourself Team Bandits, remember that? Yeah. I think that was really dumb. And Mm -hmm. I think you agree. Because you took something that, like, I understand what you, like, we've talked about this before anyway. Right. Like, that it was a matter of principle. And I even said it on my, when we talked about it, when I did my my interview, it it just happened. 
And I told, like, because it came up, you know, what you had said and then the Iowa thing. And mm-hmm. I said, like, I don't think that you were trying to do anything to hurt anybody. And like you said, you were trying to teach a guy a lesson or whatever. Mm-hmm. I believe that. But then I think that because of all the shit on Facebook and on the Internet, you, like, you started taking it, like, almost like a, it was a joke because the guy was. Right. And then, I don't know, I remember seeing that video and I thought that video was weird just because. I know you, and I it wasn't you, you know? Right. Like, it was, I don't know what you guys were trying to go with it, and then it ended up not going anywhere. Like, remember, the way you talked in that video was almost like you guys were going to try to start this thing where you guys were team banded instead of team Yeah, we're, we're <clears throat> and then it went nowhere, but. Right. I just thought, like, I don't know. I definitely think it was blown out of proportion, like what you did. Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever, leaving with the money was a choice that you made because you wanted to make a point and mm-hmm. i like i i said in that interview too i said i i'm sure you like you had every intention of sending the money back my, other people might disagree but i know you so that's the difference right but i think then trying to make light of it after all the bullshit that happened it wasn't even making light of it but just making a video making fun of it was whatever <clears throat> but you know the the video was made because the company we were working for the nba smoky mountain they wanted us to be like <laughs> that if you watch if you watch this show it would make more sense because we right. did, like this run and we Supposedly, like, stole their title and all that's jazz. But, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Didn't you do something in England, too, where you were supposed to go defend the belt? And then they sent, they said that you sent an email saying you needed yeah, to Yeah, which is great. But I, I can't spoil that just yet. But, yeah, yeah, they're really... Oh, shit. Did I just fuck something <laughs> Spoiler. Up? Yeah. Maybe we want to edit that out. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. No, it's fine. Okay. Uh, what would you have done differently if you were in the situation, you are going to a show and... Someone cancels you on the phone when you're six hours from home? I don't know. I, I definitely would have went and talked to the promoter. Like, the thing is, they... I mean, I remember the day of, because uh, they had happened, because we were feuding in Ring of Honor at the time, and that interview, or, like, the preview of you, like, talking shit about me or whatever in the shoot had come mm-hmm. out, or I don't know if the interview had already come out. That guy, Jason Strife, was tweeting at me, like, hey... Uh, Davey had some real nice things to say about you in that seminar, and he, then he stole our money or all this shit. <laughs> and then I guess he thought because tweeting at me about it, because we had the feud or we had heat, was smart. And then I asked him what happened. And then the guy gave me the fucking rundown of everything, but of course it was his version. Mm-hmm. And the thing was, and I remember texting Kyle when when he was giving me this rundown. I was like, what happened? Like, right. This just sounds completely unlike you guys. And the guy just basically, the biggest part of it was that he said you threatened the promoter. <laughs> like that you you like remember that he said you threatened the promoter and that you were gonna kick the shit out of him or something anyway I uh, if it had been me I probably would have threatened the promoter too honestly not threatened like I'm gonna kill you but like I'm not leaving till I get this fucking money and that's been done by wrestlers forever like it happens all the time does it happen when, all the time to you no that's one time uh, it didn't happen but one time it almost happened and this is what happened I it was IWM mid South. And uh, it was TPI, I forget which year, maybe 2006. And I worked for Ian a bunch of times, and I heard horror stories from Ian. I'm sure you've even lived them. <laughs> AJ Styles was owed so much money, these guys, these guys, whatever. But Ian always paid me, and it wasn't that much, but he always, he always paid me, no problem. I would always go with Generico, he paid Generico. We never had a problem, never had an issue. But then in 2006, uh, for, we did the TPI, and then... Uh, you know, was there's a whole bu- big group of us because it was TPI. There's a whole bunch of guys that, you know, Bryce Rinsberg were there, Eddie Kingston, me, Generico, just a bunch of guys. I'm pretty sure you were on. Chris Bosch was there, just Roddy. Oh, just, yeah, okay. Like, it was just that. a yeah, blast, yeah. you know, and it was a good weekend. <clears throat> but then at the end, we're at this terrible hotel because it was Ian Rotten's show. That was this hotel that had 24-hour black porn. They always have. Every hotel Ian Rotten has put me up had 24-hour... Black or white or Asian porn. But I know, porn. But I know exactly what you're talking but, about. But uh, I remember, this isn't even the same show, but one time, I think I talked about it in uh, maybe, it was either this shoot or the other shoot I did for the other company that we won't mention, right? right? can't mention that. Okay. Uh, anyway, I like I remember we, it was me, Generico, and Vanessa Craven, we went to our room. It was 12, noon, turn the, t- turn the TV on. First thing we see, a man with a giant black penis ramming a woman in the ass it's noon i just ate yeah, very I was, concerned, I was concerned about cussing <laughs> oh it's all good but uh that's ian rotten's hotels for you anyway so whatever we're in a hotel with 24-hour porn i don't even know if it was the same one 
Either way, so I start hearing rumblings because we're all hanging out in the lobby that uh, Ian's telling people we can't pay them. And I'm like, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> I can't. I, I think he, he owed me like 400 bucks for the weekend. It was nothing, but I'm like, I need that fucking money. So I, I, I tell him generic, I'm like, hey, what if, what if he doesn't pay us? He's like, I don't know, calm down, it'll be fine. And Ian's calling people like one by one in his room. I assume to fucking explain why he can't pay them. So in my mind, I'm like, well, what am I going to do if I go in there and Ian says, I'm not, I can't pay you, kid. And I don't know why, but I had made up my mind that if he said, I can't pay you, I was going to punch him in the face. <laughs> no, no word, nothing. I, I, I'm not a violent guy. I don't even know why I worked myself up to this. But I remember walking into the room when it was my turn, and I was like, my fists were balled up. I was ready to get into a fist fight with him. No idea why. And Ian, I mean, you know, everybody will say he's kind of a piece of shit for the way he does business and whatnot, but he was always super nice to me. So the why I would want to punch him in the face, I was just so angry. And then he handed me my money, and I left. He, there was no, he didn't even try to be like, uh, you know, like, hey, I can't, it just, thanks a lot, Kev. And I was like, <clears throat> hey, thanks, Ian. And that was it. That's the closest it came to. I heard other guys didn't get their money. I got really angry, and then he gave me my money, and I was really happy. So did that's you, the closest thing I came to getting stiffed. But maybe Davey has different have you, stories Have you ever been that. stiffed out of pain? Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, Alex Shane. Ooh. Yeah. I've never dealt with him, but yeah, I've Alex great Shane. things about that. And uh, that had been an ass whooping had I seen you. But what really pissed me off about that was we went over, and it was the first time I've ever been to, uh, no, I'm sorry, the second time. The first time was with PWG. But mm. the second time, we didn't went over for the Ring of Honor weekend, and then some of the guys, Alex Shane, had set up a uh, <clears throat> like a week-long tour, seminars, whatever. And it, it concluded <clears throat> in Germany. And so I stayed... Uh, me and uh, Generico stayed in his loft in London, which was just, and I had to hear this guy's conspiracy theories and stuff. It was just. I heard about yeah, this. Yeah, I, yeah I, I'm from a farm in the middle of nowhere. I don't care. Okay, you know what I mean? Like, can I dig it? Can I sell it? No, that I don't care. You know, anyways. So, uh, uh, so I go and I, I go out and stay with this other guy, uh, that nerdy guy, a really nice guy in New England. He lives in that little apartment. Is he a fan? Yeah, a huge Phil fan. Austin. Phil Austin, yeah, who's a great guy. Yeah, he's a good I guy. wouldn't say with him because I just couldn't take Shane's, whatever the hell drugs he was on. Anyways, so I want to pay. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. The last week, the last day, I'm sorry, in Germany, he, he flies this girl, that Kelly girl, from England to Germany to sit there and tell like 10 pissed off wrestlers that Alex Shane isn't going to pay him. Right? Which is just. It, it, you, well, you're already cussing. You're a pussy. Yeah, it was a pussy thing to do. You didn't man up. You didn't take responsibility for what you should have done. And that's so that was the only time. Uh, Ian actually owes me money too, but uh, I knew that one going in. So that way, yeah, that wasn't really that big of a deal. But no. But uh, the last thing I'll say in the Iowa thing is this: <clears throat> he brought up Jason tweeting him or whatever the hell they do. And then I, I remember see. I don't even have Facebook, but I remember. This whole thing unraveled throughout the week, and you were answering him on your Facebook or something like that, weren't you? And he was saying shit. And then, no, then somebody, I put out a statement. Didn't and that you was put it. your phone number or some crazy no, no, stuff? No, no, I put out a statement, and that was it. Um, he may have, but uh, like, see, I did you a favor, Jason, because I could have put all the messages you sent me and how you admitted how that was all a ploy to get yourself in Ring of Honor, and how you were begging me to get you a spot, <laughs> and how you want to fly me up so we can work this angle. Like, I know what you're doing the whole time. This is your one shot, like you know, but. You know, you're not. You're gonna have to do it the way I did it. You're gonna have to get in there and work hard and bust your ass. You didn't want to do that. You wanted the shortcut, and this is your chance. And obviously, it blew in your face. You're back in the middle of nowhere. So, I guess the ends justify the means. Uh, I know after Kevin heard the statements that you made on our interview, you guys kind of had a, a discussion and kind of worked it out over the phone. Yeah. Can Can you talk about that conversation, sure. Jen? Yeah. I mean, Go what ahead. happened was I uh, I I saw I had seen the trailer of the interview and. In the trailer, he called, like, I forget what terms he used, but shock rock or something like that. He, like, that I was just doing, like, car crash kind of thing, and it wasn't going to last. And I, I really didn't mind him saying that. If that's how he feels, that's fine. And, hey, like, for, like, I'm not so much anymore, but for those first few months where uh, I came back to Ring of Honor, I was trying to, like, shock people and just do stuff that would get talked about. That's always what I've been doing, really. I just try to get people to talk about me because I feel like that's how I stay relevant. And if that's how Davey felt about it, that was fine. But what upset me is um, somebody sent me, like, the 10-minute, I don't know, you talk about me for maybe 10 minutes or maybe even five. 
uh, in that little interview. And somebody sent me just the audio of it. And I remember I was at my mom's, and I listened to it. And at first, I didn't, like, it didn't upset me at all. But then I was like, man, I think I'm upset about some of the things he said. Like, uh, that I just couldn't go in the ring, and I was begging to go home in that title match and stuff like that. So I'm like, you know what? Maybe, or that uh, the stuff I would say about you, that's the part that upset me the most, is that you seemed upset about the things I had said about right. you. And that upset me, not because, oh, what a piece of shit. It upset me because we're friends, and I right. didn't like that I had hurt your feelings. So I remember sending you a text message, and I was angry when I sent the text. Right. It was something along the lines of like, hey, just heard what you said about me in the shoot. I guess it's just a big work, eh? Ha, ha, ha. Good old DR or some shit like that. It right. was very... And then you were like, what, what did I say that was so bad? And then I called you. Right. And I remember I was driving, and we were talking. We talked for like an hour. And I basically... I... Like, I apologize for a lot of the shit I said, right. but I want to, and you'll agree, I think, unless you disagree, but I remember in the conversation you said that all the stuff I had said about you, one, had been cleared by Ring of Honor or told to me by Ring of Honor, like Jim Cornette, to say. Right. And I always kind of made sure that you were okay with what I'd say about you. And you would always say it was fine. But <clears throat> here's the thing. You would always say it in a way where I knew that it was kind of bothering you, but that you were letting it happen because you wanted the angle to work. Like, you you know, you have a demeanor about you where if I say, is that okay, Davey? You'll be like, yeah, it's fine, that's fine. But I know that it's kind of not fine, but you're just putting <clears throat> up with it. And I've told you this before, like, and I mean, I'll say it in front of the cameras, if it wasn't for you letting me say all that shit and do all that stuff, and other wrestlers too, I would have never been as over as I was when I came back. Like, I was given, I was lucky. I was given a clean slate, not a clean slate, but I was given carte blanche to say whatever I wanted, do almost everything I wanted. And, you know, a lot of guys could have been like, hey, well, fuck this. Why right. does he get to do right. this? And right. nobody did. And that's a credit to everybody because you all let me do this. Right. And I thanked you several times for it and I thanked other, other people for it. But then when I found out that it had upset you and that some of the things I had said hurt your feelings, that bothered me because I never meant to do that. Right. And then that's why I called you and we explained right. it. And I think a lot about that part anyway. I'm not talking, like, we'll talk about you saying what you said about me during the match or whatever. But that part, you said there was a misunderstanding and it seemed like Cornette or Ring of Honor was telling you that I was coming up with this show on my own. Like, I know the thing that bothered you the most is me saying you were a shitty sh champion because you chose to go to Japan instead of coming to Ring of Honor. And I think you were told that I came up with that on my own. And I've, as I've told you on the phone, I was told to say this by Jim. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and <clears throat> you're absolutely right. You, you did call and handle it completely like a man, and I appreciate that. And it was that time when I realized that <clears throat> I um that it, w what I had been told by Ring of Honor and what you had been told by Ring of Honor at that time was uh, two very different stories. And uh. <clears throat> And uh, I really, really, I, I'm really quite ashamed of what I said because I should have done what Kevin did, which was call him first, you know what I mean, um, and, and talk to him, but I just, But you, you know. had no reason to call me in a way because this wasn't really an issue. No, I, 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 you no. were putting up with, but then when they asked you about it in the shoot, it came out because that's yeah. how you felt. No, because so I not... it is my fault, Kevin, because I, I let it pen up, and, it, and I should have called you because it bothered me, and, you know, and it, you know, I get a little bit here, and plus the thing is, like, at that point in my life, you have to realize, like, I was a champion, I was a champion, champion. I'm, go I'm just going, 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 getting to a show, going. I'm not even thinking about it. When I finally sit down and, like, think about things, I'm just, I'm, I'm pissed off, you know what I mean? And it's like, man, I'm trying to work my hardest here. I've always prided myself on hard work. And then, like, I'm thinking, like, this is coming straight from you, just trying to use me to get over. And I'm not understanding, like, they told you to say this. And now I get the whole story, and I'm like, oh, now it all makes sense. If I had known that Japan thing would bug you, I wouldn't have even said and it. I, and I 100% believe that. To me, that was the least interesting of all the shit I said. Like, when you made that comment on Twitter about how pro wrestling was your hobby and, ju like, uh, jujitsu was your passion. Right. That was like great fucking, oh my God, I got, like, I have to use this. This is great. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's where I was trying to go with it. I mean, because they were cheering you and booing me and like, let's just roll with it. You know what I and mean? Then, and then, yeah, but like stuff like that. And just like, I know one of the, th you told me that one of the things that bothered you is the way, it wasn't even what I said about you, is that after the main event in March with you and Kyle against Adam yeah. and Eddie, they had me come out and just destroy you guys on the mic. Yeah. And I, I literally said, Adam and Kyle shouldn't be in this main event. And I know that bothered you. Mm -hmm. It did. 
But I stand by what I said, not because Adam and Kyle aren't amazing, they're the fucking best, but I that main event should have been me and you. No, and I I, I agree that the main event should have been me and you. It just, but like, I know that bothered you just yeah. because you felt like it demeaned Adam and it Kyle. Did, yeah, and in a way, I, it was, and it did. But I think that was kind of the point. You know, like, that's what they wanted me to come across as. The problem is, I think the whole problem with the way that this the angle was booked... And I mean, whatever, I, just throwing Jim under the bus, but I don't care. That This was Jim's deal. It was his angle. It was, right. he, he was flawed. In his fucking mind, he didn't think people would cheer me. He literally thought people would boo me because, <laughs> no, we love Ring of Honor. How dare you? Mm-hmm. And that's crazy. Yeah. Fucking look at history. Like, how yeah. can you not tell? And then the worst part is he... He wouldn't let you have balls, remember? Yeah, no, He wouldn't absolutely. let you fucking be, hey, fuck you, or, like, tell right. the fans off. No, you were just, like, almost fucking get in the ring, do your pose, have a fucking amazing match, and even people, like, even if people are fucking booing you or, like, talking shit, you're just supposed to be like, thank you very much, I love wrestling for all of you, and that right. was the fucking worst part of it. Yeah. And then when you, I remember one time at TV, you were just like, remember you told Jim off on the, in the ring? And fucking people popped huge, and Jim was like... We came to the back. Just, that was great. Like no shit. We <laughs> yeah. tried to do it for five minutes. Four months. told me not to say any of that for yeah. out there, but I remember that. Yeah, we I mean, did anyway. It was the best best promo we did for the whole. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was a terrible, terrible. But time. I think I'll say this though. I think that one of the part that was really bothering you too, and that was making you bitter, is the fans' reaction. Not to, not the fact that they were cheering me, but I think the fact that they were booing you the way they were. And all you did was literally, and I said, remember in New York when after we had the blow off match and I, I cut that promo? Right. I said that. All you did was literally have great matches every night. You fucking put your heart into your work. You busted your balls. And they just booed. Because one, they never let you have balls back. And two, I would fucking say this shit. So I understand where you were coming from with the frustration that fuck, he gets to say, anything he wants and then you would never get to fuck you'd never have a rebuttal and then after that june show i don't know how it happened i don't know if ring of honor told you that you were off for a while or that you asked for time off i have no idea about that part but then it was just that was it the last thing that happened in that feud was me talking shit to you me talking shit to you me talking shit to you you not really getting to say anything back then i beat you for the belt then i talk shit to you Finally, you had one promo where you got to fucking say, tell Jim to fuck off. Mm-hmm. We had that match in New York. I, Kyle, Kyle told you to fuck, go fuck yourself before the match. <laughs> I beat you in the match, and then you were gone for three months. Yeah. That was your six months. So I understand why you were frustrated. What, yeah. did, what did happen? Why did you leave for three months? Uh, <clears throat> I was... Uh, <clears throat> I was going to turn into a real big shoot interview. <clears throat> so I was supposed to go to Japan for the entire summer. I was supposed to go to Japan, and then I was going to go live in Thailand... And, to train kickboxing, and uh, I, uh, I, a, a big personal goal of mine, and this will all tie in. Follow me on this. Uh, is uh, I always wanted to do, do the wrestling thing, and I always wanted to uh, graduate paramedic school. That was my two big goals in life, and I gotten so close. And then New Japan called, and I started traveling the world, and that this thing. And in March, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish school. <clears throat> And I told New Japan this at the end of it was after Tokyo Dome. I was like, I'm gonna finish paramedic school. It's a big goal for me. I really want to do this. Okay, no problem. They called me March March first, my birthday. They're like, we want to bring you in uh, March 10th. What's your birthday? Yeah, yeah, 30 years old. Jesus. Uh, (laughs) uh, uh, We're gonna put the IWGP Junior title on you, and which was a huge goal. You know what I mean? I'd be the first non-contract guy to win that uh, in a long time. And really cool. And uh, and I get there and I fly to Tokyo and I uh, you know I and I quit paramedic school again, and they're like, well, uh, plans have changed. We just need you to put over a debit, you know, which Ferg's great. He didn't do anything wrong. And I was like, oh, you fucked me. And I was like, oh, and I was like, and I, I remember I told him like last thing I will see you next time. I was like, dude, you'll never see me over here again. I'll never come back here. And uh, so. I come back and then we do the thing. He beats me for the belt, boom, and all that stuff. And they're like, we thought, and I told them the whole time, like, no, I'm, I'm gonna be here and I won't be gone. And they're like, well, we need you just to take time off, you know, like your character's stale and stuff, and this, that, and the other, and uh, and that was my deal with that. But I think the biggest thing I can look back now um, is uh, one. Uh, I'm sorry, who said to you your character was stale? Uh, the the office, Ring of Honor. Yeah, Ring of Honor, Ring of Honor office. I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. 
And, uh, you know, and it's, you know, you need to go back and just kind of refresh and then come back and, and you know, this will all be fresh and you'll go on a tear. And I can't remember, I can't remember the plans I had because I just kind of tuned out. And, and that's when I, and that's honestly where I developed the mentality that I have right now. And people can be like, oh, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, Wes. That's, you know, you're not thinking right. But, like, I, I have no place in Ring of Honor. You know, I'm a dying breed, you know. And, and people can disagree with that. And these two right here can disagree with that. And that's fine. And that's when I learned, like, I don't. I don't disagree currently. I think you're just doing whatever. Yeah, no, I am. <clears throat> but I think eventually, soon enough, you'll be doing something that matters. The problem is, I think Ring of Honor has gone from having many interesting angles <clears throat> to one main angle and then really good matches. And you're that part. You're the really good matches. You know what I mean? And I have been doing the angle part because I can't have matches like you have. So I, I get the angle, and I get the promos, and I get the thing. But the problem is, in my opinion, in order for wrestling to be super interesting, uh, even if you have amazing matches, you need strong angles behind it. I do think this is about to change in Ring of Honor because there's a change in management, and I think current management is a lot better than... And again, it might seem like I'm burying Jim, but I don't care. I think Jim's a great character, but I don't think, as, uh, as Booker, I think he, he just he wasn't going anywhere. So, But uh, that's, that's why I'm saying maybe you're right, right about now, but... I think that's going to change soon enough, but if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. Can yeah. You, yeah, can you clarify for me? Because a lot of this might sound like Davey, for the first time in several years, isn't the top guy in Ring of Honor. Yeah, no, I'm not. It's kind of no, like, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I could leave today, and it'd be the exact same show. You know, uh, you know, you know it's funny, man. I, I did a Dynamite Kid thing with you guys, and uh, I, I read that first line that you underlined. I didn't even underline it. And um, it says, like, you know, all I ever wanted to do was be the best in the ring. And uh, I didn't care about promos or characters. You know, I'll be coming out and be the first to admit, this guy will cut a better promo me any day. More interesting character. And if I was watching wrestling, I'd rather watch him. As a little kid, as just a fan, not understanding, like, work rate and stuff. Absolutely. Uh, but and, but I never cared about those things, you know. I, I cared about, you know, being the best wrestler in the world. That's what I always cared about. I think that's part of why you were getting bitter, too. And I think that started years ago with Ring of Honor. I always remember this. And this was different management. It had nothing to do with Jim or Delirious. Uh, Pierce was in charge, actually. I remember you had the match with Kenta in Houston. Yeah. And you guys fucking rocked it. And this is the thing about Davey. I got Davey, in trouble for it. Going back to, high, to the, the high spot shoot that you did, mm -hmm. obviously this is going back to why I was so upset about it, is that me and Davey, just to give people background because they might not know, I met him in 2005 in California, or 2004 in December yeah. for Gary Yap. Yeah. That's the first time I met Davey. And you were, I think you were a very different person back then. You're very, you're, you've always been kind of quiet and kind of, you know, you keep to your own. But back then you were so extremely humble. You were brand new in wrestling. You were just Tony's, Tony's kid that, you know, <laughs> you're just going around with Tony and you were doing, like, I remember the first time it was you, Tony, and Generico in a three-way. Remember that? That's the first uh, time I saw yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. And then slowly through 2005, we'd kind of run into each other once in a while in California. And then I, we wrestled for Gary in September of 05. That was our first match. Right. And, uh, God, I remember planning with you. I almost called every spot except one thing you really wanted to do. You wanted Kenta's Tornado DDT that you end up on the apron and that chokes me on the rope <laughs> and the springboard dropped you. Anyway. Wow, it must have been a long time ago if I was springboarding. I remember. And then, uh, anyway, we did that, and that was the first time we met. And then you started doing PWG because somebody dropped out of BOLA, and they booked you to take a spot that day. Yeah, and quick, when you came to the curtain, story. people went fucking ape shit because they're so happy that you were in it because you were up and coming and people wanted to see you in PWG. And that's yeah. how it happened. Starting then, me and Davey, I, I always considered you one of my best friends in wrestling because I, I, I saw a lot of me and you, weirdly. Like, we were both quiet. We don't fucking drink. We don't party. And I always appreciated that in you. And I looked up to you because I thought you were, and I've said this a million times, like one of the best in the world, easily. And I watch your matches. Like, there's very few guys that... And I'll be honest, I don't do that anymore, but that's because I don't watch any wrestling anymore, unless it's like in the Young Bucks and PWG, because I always get to do commentary on their matches. But I used to go out of my way to watch wrestling only for a few guys. I would watch Davey's matches, I would watch Colt Cabana's matches, and Generico's matches. And uh, I, you know, I just I was amazed with the stuff you did. And when we wrestled, we'd always have good matches, and I appreciated that. And we were friends in personal life. You. We talked about personal things. We've always known each other for a long time. Right. So we were close. That's why the stuff that you had said in that shooting interview was upsetting to me. Right. But I, that's why I remember the match with Kenta. Uh, 
Because, you know, you always had a weird track record in Ring of Honor as far as, as far as with the boys. Like, because you kept it yourself, a lot of boys took that weird. Even yeah. before I came back, you were there for like a year. And I kept hearing about how, oh, you know, Davey doesn't talk to anybody. He just thinks he's better than everybody else <laughs> and all this shit. And I knew, be I knew better. I knew <laughs> it was just you. And then when I got there... That's the, that shit was still going on. People would talk about you like, oh, you know, he just doesn't give a shit about anybody but himself. And I knew different. But then you were always fucking having the best match on the show. And then you had that match with Kenta. And I always remember, fucking tore the roof off, came to the back. And I'm pretty sure you got, not chewed out, but they were like, what the fuck was that? Yeah, yeah. And they were like, what the fuck were you, you know, uh, why'd you do all this shit? Why'd you take that bump to the floor? Oh, stupid. <laughs> and I felt for you, one, because... I knew you. All you were trying to do was have an amazing match. And two, I had gotten me and Janergo had gotten the same kind of shit. When Pierce took over, uh, him, I always remember this. The second show Pierce had done, like, was taken care of. Me and Janergo wrestled the Briscoes, and in the match we had a spot where I got Mark Briscoe in a sharpshooter, or Jay Briscoe in a sharpshooter, and Mark Briscoe kicked me in the face. And I'm like, no, he kicked me in the face again. Oh, I'm no, that. and I sped at him. Got a huge fucking reaction. He came off the ropes and he got fucking generical fucked up. Anyways, the best pop of the match. Then we went home. We went home. People were rocking. We got to the back. Austin Aries, Jerry Lynn, and Adam Pierce. What the fuck? You're not selling the kicks? What the fuck is that shit? Like, what do you mean? That's fucking Ring of Honor. We've been doing this for years. And I was selling it. I was fucking brushing it off and spinning in his face. It's like, yeah. And like that, like Austin Aries, who I, I like Aries a lot, but he, he said something. He's like, well, I'm never fucking taking, I'm not ever selling for Mark Briscoe's kicks ever again because I didn't fucking bump on one of them. Anyway, so that was the mentality of Ring of Honor at the time. And then this, your match with Kenta was just like four months later. And they were still in that mindset where, Less is more, and you gotta tell a story, and ugh, ugh, that fucking bullshit mindset. Anyway, and you got heat for having a great match. And truthfully, also, you were wrestling Kenta, who I'm sure had a lot of input in that fucking match. And I guarantee they didn't go up to Kenta and say, What was that, Kenta? No, they were probably like, oh, Yay! You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, I find that, I think that's when it started, that you started getting bitter with Ring of Honor just in general because of that. And then it just trickled down, and then when. All this shit happened. I think, honestly, I think you were in a happy wing of honor for a long time. Am I, like, am I maybe making this up? Or yeah, this is no, the feeling I, I got from Yeah, you. yeah, no, like, I, I was unhappy with, with ring of honor and with Noah. That was, that was my, to Noah, that match. Uh, yeah, they wanted us to do 12 minutes and have Larry Sweeney do a run-in uh, for GNCG. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, oh, that, yeah, and Sweeney didn't make it that week. Right. <clears throat> uh, that's when I first started figuring out that it, you, you got to take the bull by the horns. In wrestling and do your own thing and uh but uh yeah i am but we kind of got off subject there he was going back to what i said about, i mean i have a place in wrestling yeah, yeah uh uh i i don't um and that's the way i feel i'm not saying it's gospel uh so what does that mean when you say I don't have a place in wrestling I, I i okay so i came into ring of honor and i came into wrestling believing that like your, your work ethic is what matters, and your, your your wrestling is what matters, and and hard work is to be rewarded, and laziness is to be punished. You know what I mean? And that's that's the way I've always had the mentality, and that's the, just my personal view on things. And for a while, it seemed like that was the way things were. That's the way things were working out. We had the, you know, the Kenta match, the Tyler match, you know, the all the other matches, and uh, and then it's kind of just like, and then after the Iowa thing, this is just not between me and him, between Ring of Honor. It was like, man, I've done all this for this company. And now I've given this track record of just, you know, like killing myself for your guys is, you know, to make for everyone to make money off of. And, you know, I've always tried to do everything I can to help everyone out. I went out of my way. If we can get, like, get a laundry list of wrestlers, so I've gone out of my way to try to help out, man. And uh, and all of a sudden this one thing happens. And I'm like, nah, screw you, dude. We don't, we don't believe you. Like they told us the day before TV, oh, don't come to TV because the office is really pissed at you. You're, you're lucky you have a job still. And it's kind of like. So really, anyone could go on there and say anything. Like, Larry King can go on there and say, Davey just stole my car, and I would get reprimanded for it. We can just say whatever we want. So that's when I realized, like, wow, my work ethic, uh, the hard work, the matches, that what I believe is right about wrestling doesn't matter shit. It's what have you done for me lately. And I don't believe in that. So I have no business. I'm a dying breed, man. I have no business here anymore. So really, I'm just, to be honest with you, I'm just riding out my contract, you know? I'll say this, though. 
You've said that many times that uh-huh. you're writing out your contract. Yeah. But then you always stay because you love wrestling. I do. The problem is this, and this is my opinion, and I don't even think we've ever talked about this, but what you just said about laziness uh, gets punished, hard work gets rewarded. Right. I feel, and I don't think you said that about me, but I do think that you believe that about me for a long time. Like, I think you think that I'm lazy, or that you used to think maybe that I'm lazy, and hey, I don't work out. Everybody knows, it's a very well-known fact, I don't work out, but I'll say that, and I took the belt from you, like, you had to put me over for the belt, which you might say differently, but I think it bothered you. Because I think you felt like I didn't make the effort that I should have made in order to like have the the kind of like a match that m- did justice to your title ring. Give me one second because I get hit in the head a lot. Yeah. I don't have a long term memory like you. Uh, no, I I didn't. It, it, I I was bothered how I, how I lost the belt, not because of you, not because okay. of you, just how how the whole thing was set up is basically like I just couldn't say anything back. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Not because you. I don't think you're lazy. You know, I don't think you're lazy. No, 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 we have different philosophies on physical training. That's one part of a I huge have no alg- philosophy on physical training. That's fine. That's one part of the algorithm when it comes to wrestling. You put a lot of time in your character, into your wrestling. I, I mean, I... That's where hard work is different. Exactly. I think you and, work and I, extremely I hard at, at being a machine, and I think I work hard on thinking of creative ways not to have to work out. No, that's <laughs> not true. I think of creative ways not to... to Create right. emotion in other ways. You create emotion exactly. by having and incredible matches. You and Kyle fucking rocked it a couple weeks ago in the, with, uh, Milwaukee. Milwaukee, remember? Yeah. And I, I mean, I watched your match and I was like, oh my God, what a fucking match. There's no way I can do that. But then I went on after you guys, which was a daunting task. And even though I was in there with Roddy, Elgin, and Eddie, uh, I found a way to do what I do and make it work. Not And you know what I mean? Yeah, like, absolutely. absolutely. But I feel like... Uh, I feel like that's the thing. Maybe you wouldn't be as upset with a lot of people. I mean, the whole Ring of Honor thing with the Iowa thing and t- putting you off for a month, that's a whole different story. Obviously, right, that's a personal matter. But I feel like about wrestling in general, I feel like if you saw hard work differently, maybe you wouldn't be as, you wouldn't tend to get as, uh, not upset, but like, you know, things wouldn't bother you as much. Because Perhaps. hard work, I think hard work is different to everybody. That's all. Yeah, and I mean, there are lazy guys. I'm not going to lie. Some right. guys are really lazy. Right. And I guess I am lazy in a way, but I also think that I make up for the physical laziness or whatever we want to call it in other ways because I, I think of wrestling 24-7. Mm-hmm. I uh, don't watch it that much anymore, but that's because I don't really have time. I have a family, but I think about it all the time. If fucking ask my wife, she fucking can't stand it. That's all I talk about. But right. To me, that's hard work too. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, and I absolutely agree. And you know, like I'm, I'm reiterating what I said earlier. Like I'm not saying what I, everything I say is gospel. That's just my personal yeah. view. And like, I like I'm always, I'm always gonna have that view that I developed when I was an amateur wrestling was if I wow, if I work harder than you, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna be rewarded for that. And like, and I and I have to consistently rhyme, remind myself even to this day, even right now, that I'm not in a real sport. I'm in an entertainment business. You know, an entertainment aspect. And I and that's. Something I've always had trouble with. I've always had trouble wrapping my head around that, and uh, and that's created a lot of personal problems, which is, as of late, become you know, external problems. And then I don't know because I know you have another question, but let's just close out that portion of what he said about me. Okay. Um, we got away from it now, but I was upset about the fact that I had to upset him, and I never set out to be ups- like upset him. And I was also upset about what you said about the actual match, which was that you said I was kind of begging you to go home and cut, trying to cut shit out. You remember saying that? Yeah. I will say this. That is inaccurate. I did try to cut one thing out, which was my pump handle knee breaker, uh, neck breaker deal I do, and that's because we planned it. Then backstage before the match, I said, hey, let's not do that. And you said, no, no, let's do it. And in my mind, I immediately thought, I'm just going to kit it out in the ring. And I tried to cut it out in the ring, and you said no, and you made me do it anyway. That's the only time I tried to go home early in that mm-hmm. match, but it wasn't going home early. I was just trying to cut that move because right. I didn't want to do it. Yeah, and I, and I, like, but I'm what not, do you remember? I'm curious. No, I, I remember the exact same thing, and I thought you did it because you were you were gassed out of your head. You know what I mean? Because I remember you breathing really heavy. And that and I that's, do. That's true. Yeah. I do. No, and that's that's. I'm not gonna lie. Like you know, that's that's one of my little sick things that I do is I, I enjoy blowing up my opponent. That's something I do. That's an issue that I personally feel. That whatever it's your thing, and now you admit it, which is great because I don't have to call you out on it. No, it's why fine, do you do that? Because I'm, I'm like, always... don't you think that adapting to your opponent is what really makes you a great wrestler? Well, I mean, I'm going to sound arrogant here, but if you look at my tracker, I think I've adapted to quite a few opponents very well. 
from all over the but, world. Yeah, you've adapted to guys that are in insane shape and can do the same kind of match you can. But and this is the thing: we've had so many matches, so many great matches. Yes, the only the I think the Toronto match was really good. I don't know how I, you no, felt fantastic. about it. Fantastic. But I think that that was the only match where I felt like we weren't working the same match in a way. And well, I think that's because you were trying, maybe because you were mad about the way you were losing the belt and you were kind of trying to take it, not take it out on me per se, but go ahead. This is my theory on this. I remember that. And like, so you, you talked about how you know me for a long time. I've known you for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I remember, just let me finish here. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember you were not the same Kevin today. You were extremely nervous. You were extremely yeah. just, yeah. And I remember that because when I won the title, it does something to you, man. So much to where I got knocked out in the match with Eddie, and I don't think Eddie even knocked me out. I think I kind of like hyperventilated, and that's the honest to God truth. And I remember you were so uh, nervous in the match that you weren't like the same Kevin. And I, had, it wasn't ever one of those things that I was like, oh, you know what, I'm going to go in there and just try to make this guy look. Is that what you're going to trying to make you look bad no, or something No, no, like no, that? no, no, not at all. Oh, I don't okay. think you were trying to make me look bad. Okay. I just think that uh, you've said yourself you like to blow up your opponent. Yeah. But why, if, if, like, why do that in any kind of match? And I, I didn't feel that you ever tried to do that to me ever no. before. And I, I didn't even feel it then, but you just admitted it yourself. So mm -hmm. I, that's why I'm asking why do that. Because I, the way I was trained, uh, and, and later got reconfirmed by me being fans of who I was a fan of wrestling, uh, was that this is for, and I remember me and Brian talking about this in my first tour of Noah, is like wrestling is for the, the, the very elite, the best athletes. That's what professional wrestling is. We're supposed to be in the best possible shape. And if someone can't hang, it's not, it's not your responsibility to keep up with them. I'm, I'm sorry, to, to, to carry them. It's their responsibility to keep up with you. You know what I mean? And uh, you probably remember me saying a lot of times, and like we'll do like something in our match, I'll be like, oh, you blowing up, bud? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, uh, I remember actually, but, the first thing you said, sorry, go finish. And yeah, then sorry. I, 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 was, I, I get hit in the head too much. I get sure hit to her memory. I think I but, get hit but, in the head too sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you more than me. I'm not sure. Though. Uh, you just have a thicker head than me. But uh, I, uh, I, I've never had a problem with, with, with you having that in the ring. Uh, I, I've never, ever, ever had a problem with you doing that in the ring. You know what I mean? Um, you never one of the guys where I'm like, oh, I gotta carry this big guy. Oh my gosh, this is gonna suck. I've never, ever, ever had a problem. And we've always had great matches. So as far as me adapting to my opponents, uh, I'm just curious as to why you have that mentality, but if it goes back to your training and your beliefs, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. I was trained very differently. And right or wrong, by the way. Yeah. I, no, 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 I don't think anybody's right or wrong, but here's the thing. Uh, you talk about the blow-up thing. I remember um, I, I won the belt. I went through the curtain. My face full of cake still, because somebody had just given me a cake that they made, and I put my entire face in it. And I got to the back. And I was with Jimmy, and then it was weird. Like, the whole roster did, like, a circle thing, and they were clapping. And I'm like, thanks. And then Carrie's, like, speech. And I'm like, this, why? Just say something. I'm like, all right, well. And you were still in the ring selling. And I said, well, uh, thanks, everybody. If you didn't let me say everything I say and do everything I do, I wouldn't be half as over as I am now, so thank you. And then you came through, and the first thing you said, not good match, not thanks, you were so blown out there, man, in front of everyone. <laughs> and I just went, ha, ah, and I turned to Jimmy Jacobs, and Jacobs like, what an asshole. But I'm like, eh, what are you yeah, going to do? But, but before and after that, uh, before we went out and after that, I was like, hey, man, I'm really happy for no, you. No, you did. You took me aside at the end, and you said yep. that you didn't want like, you were happy. If you, if you were going to drop the belt to anybody, you were glad as me. And that really meant a lot to me, too. Because I felt like there was weird tension throughout the whole feud. And I, like I said, I don't think... You were holding it against me. I think you were just mad at the company, and yeah. it was easy to tell. I would even ask Kyle once in a while, like, "Hey, is Davey all right? Like, with me and the shit I'm saying?" Kyle would always say, "Yeah, yeah, man, don't worry about it." <laughs> so you know, yeah. but yeah, so that kind of closes the whole chapter of the shoot. I call them. We iron things out, and as you can see now, things yeah, are and fine. you know, and, and, and me closing is, you know, I, I just want to take the opportunity to say that. Uh, a lot of the things I said against Kevin were, even though I, I thought I was told by Ring of Honor management that he was saying these things, and uh, you know, I, I should, I should have taken the route he did, which was the higher route, and, and called him personally. But I was very, very bitter and frustrated at, at wrestling as a whole, between Japan, between Ring of Honor, because, you know, uh, I just felt, I felt betrayed. You know, and and I and and Kevin was honestly the scapegoat for a lot of that, and and that that's completely wrong, and that's why I went, and I also found out through this I have no place in social media, by the way, uh, <laughs> but one of the last things I wanted to do on my little adventure in social media, which is 
Well, actually, apparently I'm on social media right now. Well, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, see, but, I, but apparently I've gotten a lot nicer, so that's good. But anyways, uh, I want to go publicly. I want to be inside and say, hey, I want to apologize to Kevin for the things I said. Because I felt bad. And yeah, it was I uncalled for. And, and there's no and there's no excuse for doing that to a friend. He's always been a friend of me. And um, and and so I, I was wrong. And, and I, I apologize for I'm apologizing. I feel bad. It's terrible. Good. And uh, But, yeah, apparently I still am on Twitter. I have no idea what I'm saying. I'm probably having conversations with Mike Mondo. Let's put it out there. We're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> really? come back out later. We're gonna let you read your own Twitter later. Oh okay. sweet, okay, this will so, be great. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll maybe close. Well, the, just so uh, people know, know, Davey Richards eighty three on Twitter used to be you. Yeah. Then it wasn't you anymore, but somebody took over the account and still acts like Davey Richards and writes the funniest shit. If you read it yourself and you don't know Davey personally, it's not that hilarious. But for me, because sometimes it'll get retweeted and I'll see it, Davey complimenting The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak is so fucking funny. Oh, really? Funny. That, uh, you've, 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 like, Triple H worked an angle where he's retiring and you, like, the next day, oh, Triple H, thank you for everything you've done. And it's just so <laughs> funny. So, uh, yeah, I, I worked it out so that maybe Davey later will read some of those tweets as if he had. Yeah, I'd love to. No, I mean, you've already brought it up. We've gone too deep. Let's gonna, do it. All right, we're too deep stuff. in. Okay. I was trying to give him a chance to cue it up before. No, we let's just do it now. Later, gonna... Let's get rid of it. I asked uh, ahead of time to get some of the tweets ready for Davey to read. So call, just read all so, those. So you're gonna, oh, let's be, are you teaching him how to do Twitter? Right no, now? he knows how to do Twitter. He did it for a while, but just those are the ones that uh, I, I said were the best ones. And then I just, a fan actually asked me, can you get Davey to read those tweets? So there you go. So this is the kind of stuff that your alter ego has been tweeting. So about. who knows? Oh God, this is terrible grammar. <laughs> who, bear with me on this. Who knows what happened next in pro wrestling? It's Davey Richards' time. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, where's Santa? Well, that one's valid. Merry Christmas Eve, jerks. This is the, jerks. This is the great stuff. Yeah. And here comes the shield. Who's the shield? It's uh, Tyler, Ambrose, and uh, Roman Reigns. is the new group there that they're doing. And they keep running into people's matches, uh -huh. which is, explains the next line. Go ahead. Read, it, read, it, if, read okay. it if, if you've written Okay, verbatim. Okay, I'm sorry. And here comes the Shield WWE to ruin a great moment. Here comes Kane and Bryant. Oh, so you're doing commentary. Okay. Yeah, like, but think about Davey sitting at home writing about Kane. <laughs> Get him, Kane. Get him. <laughs> Choke slam. All right. Uh, man, here's the mic. But, uh, see, the mic told me about this. Because the funny part about yeah, this some was... Some guys don't know, so they tweet at Davey like Mondo... Who fucking, I love Mondo, but he might as well live in a fucking spaceship. Like, he might as well live in a spaceship. He doesn't. There's an interview shooter if you got to do that guy. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I would buy, because that guy, I love you, brother, but you're on planet Mars. Yeah. Even Tyler Black didn't know it was you. It wasn't you, so like. Oh, jeez, anyway, really? go ahead. Just keep reading. Well, uh, hold on. Before I read the Mike Mondo, the funny thing about Mondo was he came up and he's like, hey, girl, it was really cool to see you on Twitter last week. We had a good conversation. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Okay, I was like, because, you know, I'm not really that. You know, I don't really articulate a lot of people. Okay, yeah. And I was like, anyway, so, Mike Mondo. Uh, see you soon, pal. Oh, the final battle. Watch me kick ass. I'm the best in the world. Sorry, punk. This, yeah, this guy's going to start giving me a bad name. Uh, hmm, how about Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards team up once again? Watch his face with Ryan and Bobby, the smelly fish. <laughs> now, brother, you got to be thinking something better than that. You're going to entertain me. All right, at Big, Big Mr. Big Miller at Ring of Honor at El Generico. Instead of him kicking out of his opportunity, let's see a triple threat match can happen. Where's the one about Undertaker? I couldn't find it. It went over like three times. Okay, whatever. Maybe you deleted I, it. I saw the Triple H one. Just choose, choose which. Yum! I'm stuffed to death. I could take a nap. So we got it. Oh, read one about. Yeah, Davey Richards sent this to CM Punk. Go read it. Oh, oh, God, that's go beautiful. Okay, CM Punk has more than three dudes in his next invasion group. He's got like seven or eight to help him against the faces like Cena and Ryback. And now he's getting in a fight with people. I like cheese dogs, he says. No need to talk about yourself. Be careful what you say, dick brain. One of my favorite... Is this the way people talk now? I don't know, man, but it's the way you talk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, apparently. Right, I'm guilt by association. Look, look, you said uh, Steen is an absolute joke. That one might have been written by you when you were angry. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. Punk and Heyman. L-M-A-O. <laughs> wow. The this is a great one. I saw this one. Read this one as if you had written it. 
Wow, Matt Hardy Brand is following me. I got so much respect for you, and I hope he has respect for me. Fair enough. You might respect them and everything, but why would you write that? Here, WWE Rollins. Congrats, man. Why aren't you up in the big league now? Why can't beer money just reunite? <laughs> I never saw that one before. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is my favorite. Dave Richards, I'm going to be jacked for Halloween. Oh, wait, I heard he am. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Anyway, so there you oh, go. Here, and Mike Bennett saying I'm fake. I'm not fake, and you would know that if you're smart. Uh, anyway, you got so many prizes. Oh, that's my it. number one thing, apparently. Why can't beer money just reunite? Why wouldn't it be? CM Punk and Cole Cabana doing a comedy show together tonight. All the people there should get ready to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that was uh, Davey Richards 83. Check for, my website. I'm not fake. We're going to watch remember, how much this skyrockets now. Right? I remember texting Davey and saying, hey, this guy is like, uh, this guy even has a link to your website, to which you replied. I don't, I don't have a website anymore. Yeah, I don't have any of this stuff anymore. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not, I'm not too oh, big on man. the internet. Whoever's though. doing this, though. Keep up the great work. Oh, here. My here. favorite is when I see wrestlers that I know, that know both of us, tweet at Davy Richards eighty three because they don't know it's not you. At apparently like, at yeah, at you and Rollins at, at a whole Rollins. thing. Yeah, miss you too, dude. Oh here, God, I, I hope Tyler didn't say you missed me to this guy. No, he here. This is what happened. You were saying. Uh, How do I see what they said? I don't know. Maybe. You, anyway, I remember this because this is when I got involved. You said. Tyler, you wrote to Tyler, hey, quit busting your ass. And Tyler's like, ha, 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 I don't know any other way, man. Uh, you know, it's been a while. Hope things are good. And then you answered, oh, I miss you too, dude. I heard you're winning titles <laughs> over in WWE. And then I was like, I'm still hearing Rio Tyler, Marco this isn't it. him. And the guy's like, Steve, stop messing around. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's when I texted you. You said you didn't have a website. But hey, whoever's doing it, you're thoroughly entertaining. And especially when you tweet about Undertaker and Triple H. Like, Davey's such a big fan of those. Yeah, well. Keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah, you know. Uh, I bet it's Tony. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> that would be great. That would explain all the long nights I hear Tony screw around his phone in his room. Isn't this just Tony? This is what Tony does all day, isn't it? Dude, dude. I literally walked into Tony's room at 2 a.m. And he's laying there naked with a towel on him doing this on his phone. <laughs> The day Tony's phone broke as he burned out the battery was a man with no purpose in life. It was the saddest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, man. Been away for a while. Been busy. This is the way he writes. He writes like, been away for a while. Been busy doing my job. In brackets, wrestling. Hashtag American Wolf. Good All stuff. All right. Good stuff. Okay. Are we back? Yeah, we're back. Let's read one last tweet, please. Randy Orton tweeted, just watched, 180 days ago, Randy Orton tweeted, just watched the True Blood finale. Pretty badass. To which Davy Richards, 83, replied, yes, yes it is. Davy Richards watches True Blood. Or at least someone wishes he did. What is it? It's a HBO show about vampires, but like oh. current day vampires. Oh, wow, well, yeah, I might like that. No, no, it's terrible. I, I disagree with you, but that'll be another, another <laughs> Whatever. Well, I wanted to maybe uh, update a lot of what's happened in Ring of Honor since uh, since we last did our interview. A little bit less has happened since since the one we did with you, Kevin. But having the well, two we did together, it a month apart, so not yeah, really. Well, uh, safety in numbers here. So, you know, we've already kind of gone down the Jim Cornette yeah. road. But I, but I did want to ask some questions. Uh, tell, tell me, how do you feel Ring of Honor's changed since Sinclair has taken it over? Uh, there's... there's a, I, the houses have gone up because um, we have national television. That's really good. Um, he'd be the better person to ask, to be honest because I'm literally, I'm not, when I'm there, I'm not there. So I'm just kind of doing my thing. Yeah, like, Davey's always been kind of off on his own. I kind of keep more, uh, I keep my finger, I like, and I was like this even before Sinclair took over, is I always like to keep my nose in almost like business that doesn't really concern me, but I like to know things. So I would always ask uh, Ross at the merch table, you know, hey, how you know how we do on merch? And yeah, we did good. Or like I would talk to Sid about just upcoming shows and ticket sales. And I kind of still do that with Sinclair, but it's very different. Like I don't get to know anything now because it's a corporation and just yeah. that stuff. Yeah, they not passed the, the buck a lot. I'll say that. But um, I mean, I think the way it's changed is. 
it's changed a lot in different ways over the past. Sinclair's had it for what a year and a half now. Yeah, about. Uh, I wasn't there for the first few months because they took it over in June of uh, 2011, and I, I wasn't there till December on full time. I was still in the company, kind of, because we did the angle where I was coming back. But uh, I only met the like Joe Koff, the president, like in December, and uh, he didn't know who I was. I don't think. And then, uh, but ever since then, I, I now have a pretty good relationship with Joe Koff. Everything's fine, and I think it's changed in many ways. First, Jim, they literally gave Jim all the power really and i think that it changed ring of honor a lot then because um jim booked his, the angles that he thought were good and i think uh i don't know i think it brought new fans because of the tv audience like the new tv market but i also think that ring of honor wasn't what it was so i think it uh alienated a lot of the hardcore ring of honor fans yeah. like the fans that would buy the dvds for the first eight years I think a lot of those people were really pissed with what the product became and yeah. maybe stopped watching or at least would still watch but just not not care as much. So I think that was not great. I mean, we weren't losing fans in a way because we were losing fans, but we were getting new ones too. And to the people that had never seen Ring of Honor before, and I think I said this uh, not like in a shoot interview, but I said this in an interview on a website or on a podcast before is – if you watch Ring of Honor and had never seen it before and didn't know what it used to be, the Ring of Honor you were seeing with Jim Cornette's corny, uh, you put $5,000, we put $5,000, and the winner of the match gets ten grand, which I think is insulting people's intelligence. It's, it's dumb, and it's, it might have worked back in the 80s, but today it's really silly. But to fans that had never watched Ring of Honor before... I'm sure they watched that and been like, yeah, right, you know, the winner gets 10 grand, whatever, but they still enjoyed the wrestling. So I think that Ring of Honor was pretty cool still. It was just not as cool to the people who were used to what Ring of Honor was, which was about, you know, guys just busting their asses and no, like for the most part anyway, no cheesy angles, which I think was what Ring of Honor has been for a year, was really cheesy stuff. Like even us, like... The Canadian flag and the American flag. Yeah, that? Yeah, Walk, yeah, like yeah. That's just so silly. It's just not, you know, I mean, let WWE do that stuff if they want, but why us? Like, we were always a great that's alternative. We were always a great alternative to what they did. And it seemed like uh, that was changing. But then now Jim's gone, and I think it's changing again in a different way. And it's not it's going to be what Ring of Honor used to be in the sense that it's not going to be the exact same Things will still be different, but I think it's heading in a great direction again, which I don't think uh, when Jim was in control, it was heading in a horrible direction. I just don't think it was uh, as good as it could have been because I used to think of Ring of Honor as a cool, edgy product that uh, anybody could watch and uh, be like, huh, this is, this is different than what I'm used to, and it's interesting. And then I think when Jim took over, it wasn't that anymore. It was just like, oh, look, it's wrestling. You know, it was just cheesy wrestling, but it was really good wrestling. If you could stand the, uh, you know, the cheesy uh, promos to hype up the, uh, you know, the Richmond show where we're going to have, you know, the Battle of Richmond and just stuff like that. You know what I mean? If you could look past that, then you still had really good wrestling. The only problem is for a while there was run-ins every match. Remember that? Yeah, run -ins, like WCW. Run-ins, pull-aparts every match, every match, every match. That was getting really annoying, too. But now, again, we're going back to something really good, and I think we're going back to, you know, wrestling is what matters, and, and the rest will follow with it. And he's right. Like, the houses have gone up, and uh, this year I think we're doing more shows than we did last year, which is great for all the wrestlers. And also, I get recognized now, which I, I never used to. And now I walk through airports, and people like, hey, you, you're, you're the Ring of Honor champ. And even last night at the show I did in, uh, was it Gibsonville? Is that where the show was at? Like, people come up to me and tell me, hey, we watch you on Ring of Honor. That's why we're here, because we, we saw that you, the Ring of Honor champion was going to be here, which I never heard before. They, hey, Steen, how's it going, man? I've been watching, I used to watch IWS, and I see you in PWG, you know? And, you know, Ring of Honor, it's good to see how you're doing Ring of Honor. It's people that used to follow me from before, and it happened once in a blue moon. And now people come, and they know me because of Ring of Honor, you know what I mean? So it's definitely reaching more people, and that's good too. And, uh, you know, that's part of the changes. And, of course, it's changed. Like I said, it's a corporation now, so things are very different. And 
I don't know. It's not as... Uh, I don't think the wrestlers are as hands-on as they used to be. Like, no. it's not really a mom and... It's not a mom and pop shop anymore where, you know, if we had an idea and we wanted to try something, we could go up to Carrie and tell him. Now we could still go up to Joe Coff and talk, but the thing is Joe's got to go through other people yeah, to see if it works, you know? So those are the main changes, but like I said, I don't... Um, I don't know. I think it, it, it went through a change that wasn't necessarily awesome, but it wasn't necessarily harmful either in that when Jim was take, took over and the TV product was a lot cheesier than it was. And now it went through another change already where I think uh, we're heading back into a really good direction. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Sid was uh, let go. Uh, do, you, do you think things have changed a lot? I mean, that, he was kind of a hands-on guy for years. And, yeah. You know, probably did more hands-on stuff from the company than anybody else, and they, they decide to let him go. Have you, yeah. have you seen any changes since Sid left? I mean, I've seen a change, and the main part is I, I was really close with Sid. Yeah. I really like Sid. Me too. Yeah. So And Sid had a lot of detractors. Like, a lot of people didn't like Sid. Yeah. And I wasn't one of them. Sid was never anything but amazing to me. Yeah. He helped me out more times than I can count uh, in various ways. Like, if I needed a, 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 like a little advance because I was tight on money, Carrie would say yes, Sid would make it happen, or Sid would make it happen and tell Carrie later, and Carrie was always fine with it, obviously because he trusted Sid. And the main difference is Sid's not there anymore, so I don't, you know, I don't hang out and talk to Sid anymore, and I don't get to know stuff about how, yeah, business is doing all right, we're going to try to go to this town, we're going to try to go to this town. Now you just kind of sit back and you it's find lost out. That, it's kind of lost that Team ROA yeah, feel. Yeah, you know it's I mean? not really a family. There, there's definitely that... Uh... It doesn't have a little family thing feel anymore. But, yeah, there's I mean, definitely that discrepancy between like you know, like oh, you know, the boys and like the office. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh, not that the office is bad though. I'll say no, I'm not trying to demonize might, anyone. No, it might seem like I'm kissing their ass, but whatever. They're not bad people. I I uh, I like everybody that's in the office, but there's definitely there's the guys that deal with the office, and then there's the wrestlers. Right. And once in a while, the office will come talk to the wrestlers, but most time it's it's a separate thing and. That's okay too. Yeah, yeah. So, such as such as business, you know. That's yeah. just, so that's you know growing pains. The uh, a common perception is that uh, Greg Gillion doesn't really understand wrestling. Hmm. Do, do you share that same opinion? I don't know about that, but I don't think it matters. Like his job, I don't think whether he understood wrestling or not. I don't think it matters. I think he, his job is to handle like business stuff and money stuff, mm -hmm. and I think he's doing just fine. Like, and again, I mean. It's kind of weird that he's even brought up because I, I didn't even know he was like, like I didn't even know people thought knew the name Greg, you know what I mean? But I think, I don't think it matters if he knows wrestling or not. I don't know if he does, but I think his job has nothing to do with wrestling. It's all about the business part of it, so. How frustrating was it? I mean, when they took over in Chicago, one of the things they promised you guys was there'd be more dates, which, you know, more dates means more money for you guys. And, you know, at this point, it really hasn't happened. I think it's happening now, though. I've had the schedule for the next few months, and it seems like there's more dates. There's definitely more dates than last year. I think maybe what happened, and I wasn't there for that meeting in Chicago. I found out what, ha like, I found out about the company being sold on Twitter. I was having dinner with my wife, and I got a text message from Carino saying this is what happened, and I already knew because they had put it on the website, ROHWrestling.com. That's how I found out. And I wasn't there, but I heard that they promised, like, more shows and I think that they meant it, but I think that when they first took the company over, and Davey might disagree, but I think they meant, and even, like I said, I wasn't there when they said it, but what I know of them now, I think they meant what they said, but when they, I think maybe they thought it would be more profitable right away, and then they saw that it wasn't as profitable uh, that, as they thought, so I think they just decided, well, the first year is not going to be more shows, it's actually going to be less shows, because we've got to figure out another business plan, and I think now they have, and they, I think now they know where they're going and they know what they want to achieve. And uh, I think it's getting better. So I hope it translates to even more shows. But I think they've started to take that, that step. Does it scare you a little bit that uh, a company, their direction is really dictated by whether they make money or not? Because Carrie really oh, yes. funded Ring of Honor for years at a loss. Yes, this is the difference, exactly. Carrie love, loves pro wrestling. And he kept Ring of Honor alive through losses because he wanted it he wanted to be a part of pro wrestling, and he wanted the boys who he became close with, because Carrie's friends with every wrestler he had, or almost friends, you know. He wanted those guys to have a place to wrestle. Now, obviously, it's a corporation that's, there's stockholders, there's uh, 
uh, people that like you know there's people that want to see profits. So if Ring of Honor isn't making a profit, they might just pull the plug. Who knows? So of course it's it's more stressful in that aspect. Like I feel, uh, but at the same time they have more means than Carrie did, and they have better knowledge of business. So you know it's kind of. You know, it's 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 hard. I get it's hard to gauge. Like I I don't think Carrie would have I don't think Carrie would have ever closed down the company, and that might have been awful because maybe he would have lost all his money. You know what I mean? Or his mind. Yeah, or his mind. And I think he was losing his mind at one point. I think because he didn't want to close the company, but I think he need he felt like need to. But then he sold the company, and then now he sold the company to people that know business and have a business plan and know what they want to achieve. So the company I feel is in better hands in the. Like in the sense, like the like corp like business, like I said, they know what they're doing. They've they built a network from the ground up almost. You know, like they bought TV stations and however it happened, they made that into what it is now. So now that they have the wrestling company, they have knowledge of how to make something grow. So I think like it's positive in that aspect, but also the only difference is Carrie probably cared more about the actual wrestling. So. In that aspect, it could be negative. We'll see in the long run, but for now, it really seems like lately, especially things are going really well, so I feel pretty secure and pretty good so about it. So you don't look at it as like, man, their fiscal year is up at the end of the year. I wonder if we're going to do well enough for this to continue. Not right now. I think things are going really well from, on all accounts anyway. The, what we're being told and everything's really positive. Yeah, I mean, we're it's being good. told, you know, it, it, it was it was a necessary step. I mean, with Definitely. Carrie, it was uh, it was it was like it was the clubhouse. Carrie you know? kept it alive as long as he could yeah, on his own means. It, 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 it was it was definitely a, a more close knit family, but it was it, it was the clubhouse. You know, it was like you know we're doing a softball league, and you know we're gonna try our best, but really it's more it's just not about business. It's about the social hour. You know what I mean? And but eventually, you know what I mean? One guy taking all that brunt, all that financial, because you know we're showing up and we're wrestling. Hey man, good match. All right, yeah, rock and roll. And then Carrie's one looking at the numbers, going, "Oh my god, yeah. okay." I remember and, towards the end, Carrie would walk around and he wasn't the same. Like, yeah, he looked stressed exactly, out. Exactly, you know what I mean? Like he was having a good time. And, and because we're that close knit family, I, I don't, I don't want to see someone I care about going through that. You know what I mean? Mm. And so it's, it's a necessary step. And you know, and like, you know, we're kind of gonna, we're gonna live and die by the sword. You know what I mean? And if we can't, you know, if we can't produce, you know, because every wrestler is going to go out there and all we know what to do is go out there and do our job the best of our yeah, ability. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I can't handle, you know, what venues they book or, the, you know, the strategic location or, you know, what, what other events are in town. I can go out there and, well, she got 15 minutes to do this. Let's rock and roll. Yeah, because we used to have more, uh, like, I remember I brought Ring of Honor Montreal. Because I, I told him, hey, we should just, let's try to run shows in Montreal. And Kara's like, okay. Sent Sid out there. Sid found a venue with a friend of mine, Pat. I don't know if you've met Pat. Anyway, this guy, uh, he wrote a book about wrestling. I'm sure he's thrilled if he ever hears this that I mentioned him. Uh, anyway, so that guy, Pat, helped Sid find a venue and helped run the show and helped promote it. And uh, we did two shows in Montreal. The first one did pretty good. The second one didn't do that good. And then we never went back. But, like, I can't go up to Sinclair Management and say, hey, let's do a show in Montreal. Because they'd be like, uh... Well, we don't, we don't have TV in Montreal. What's the point of that? And they'd be right. You know what I mean? Uh, you do better. Me, we have TV in St. Louis, and I still want to show there. <laughs> so maybe eventually they will. But, but it's odd so. because you know I'll, I'll just speak here in North Carolina. They they did pretty well in Charlotte, but because there's not TV in Charlotte, they're choosing to run two hours away from here. It's like even mm -hmm. towns that they did well in, they don't seem to want to go back to without but the television. But see, that's the thing though. That's part of their business plan. Uh, it might work or it might not work. We'll see what happens. But the thing is, I have faith in them because I think that I've seen the company get better under like. At first, when I came back last year, like when we they weren't running more shows, it was a little like a little concerning. But I find this year especially. Like this year, but I mean in the last six, seven months, I've seen the company get better. From the iPay-Per-View debacle to now, the iPay-Per-Views are great. They're really good. They're well, like they work well. They're well produced too. They have like graphics. It's, it looks like you're watching a, a pay-per-view on TV. That's a great step from not people ordering it and not even being able to see it to now it works good. And uh, they now they've started putting the house shows on online, mm -hmm. on demand. The show we did last Saturday has been on demand, like been available on the website for three days, mm -hmm. which is awesome. I think it's a great step in the right direction, and I think they're doing things to move forward, which is really cool. And again, also one of the positive things is, um, like Sinclair is a huge company, and they they their their business is TV, and now they have wrestling, which is 
kept alive by the TV. But the people taking care of the wrestling company obviously want to look good to their bosses and the other shareholders and all that stuff. So they want wrestling to work out. You know what I mean? Like, Carrie obviously wanted wrestling to work out. Sid wanted wrestling to work out. Everybody did. But those guys, their jobs depend on it. So they really want wrestling to work, and they want to make it work. From Greg to Joe to everybody involved. So I think that's a, a positive thing, too, about it. Is, uh, you know, when it, it got sold... Everybody's like, well, now it's a corporation, but I don't think that's a bad thing, honestly. You can and watch the shows on the internet now? Yeah. Damn. You can watch your match with Carl. I'm so out twice. of the loop. <laughs> and also, um, the uh, one of the things, too, is they want to make money, which in turn also helps us make money. Like, uh, the royalties are better now. The royalty we get off yeah. the t-shirts and stuff, and they're they're committed to because they, and they make money off of it, so... I've had like six shirts or five shirts in the last like six months or no, not maybe six months, but since I came back in the last year, I've had like six different shirts. A lot. Of, some people are even like, when, I remember when the last one came out, they were like, God, another Steen shirt? But it's because they, they know that I, they're, they're going to sell those shirts. They're going to make money. I'm making money. They made two DVD compilations of me. They made two of you or one of you and one of you and Eddie together. And you know what I mean? They, they make these DVDs now. They're committed to like, they... They and have the royalties on something like that. Well. Yeah, of course. But what's great about it is they have the money to invest in the merch that will then sell and make us money. Carrie would do it, but he wouldn't do it as much. Like they didn't do comp DVDs for a, like compilations of like a certain guy. I remember Ross would tell me, we "Can't really do compilation DVDs because they cost a lot to make, and we don't know how the return is going to be." They started doing them because Sinclair had the income, like had the, the means to do it, and those things are doing great. They sell a lot, and everybody makes money off of it. So, and you know, like like I said, we make money from the royalties, they make money from the merch, and then that keeps the whole company going, like stronger. So, I, I think in time too, is as the office becomes more knowledgeable of our product before they stepped into it, because mm. you know, a lot of reason why we're just running places just to have TV is because to a guy sitting up in an office in Baltimore, he's never, you know, doesn't know the history of Ring of Honor or even professional wrestling for that matter. He's going, well, strategically, it makes sense. We have TV here. We obviously run around here. You know what I mean? But I think as they get to more know about our product and go, oh, you guys have done well in Charlotte. There has been a good history there. You know what I mean? Let's go there. You know. So hopefully, you know, I, I think it's basically what like what we're trying to say is like it's it's. It's not where it's, we want it to be, and hopefully it never will be because we always want to go higher, but it's, it's on the right track now as a forward. We're just kind of dangling out in the middle of nowhere. You know? Yeah, a lot of, for a while I heard uh, the term grow, growing pains. Oh, it's growing pains. Like we'd have problems with somebody fucked up travel. Well, it's growing pains, you know. Everybody's getting used to what they're doing. And I, at first I would roll my eyes at that growing pains. Maybe it's true because now things are running really smoothly and it's still the same people doing the same jobs. So I think everybody got used to what they're doing and... I think we're growing, so that's good. And I think slowly but surely, and I hope, I mean, how people who listen to this and are part of those hardcore fans that were maybe pushed away from the product by what it was, the cheesy booking or the cheesy angles or the cheesy matches or the cheesy uh, stuff that... <laughs> or uh, yeah, the eye pay per view bullshit. I hope that listening to us talk about this is going to bring them back because I think they're... If they gave it another shot, they'd probably be pleasantly surprised. Dave, you were kind of like Cornette's boy. <laughs> Here's do you, the, do you this feel, is very interesting. Do you feel like um, you, know, you were really super hot there for a while and you were carrying the company and then Cornette comes in and turned away a lot of the hardcore fan base. Do you feel like maybe being Cornette's boy really kind of hurt you? Yeah, uh, yeah it's not hurt. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I guess I've been... I literally coined that phrase, Cornette's yeah. boy. And I know that's one of the things you really hate. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I, out of anyone on that roster who talked to Jim, I think I talked to him the least. Yeah. Uh, but hey, let's be honest. Jim fucking loved you. Yeah. He saw you in his soup. Yeah, and that, and that's and that's fine. But like the thing is, is and, and I get it, and I, you know, I don't even hold Jim at fault for this. It wasn't as bad at first because when Jim took over, like when Jim came in after Adam got canned, Jim wasn't the guy with all the power at first, and he had three of you to, uh, to like, spread his obsession over. He loved you, he loved Hero, and he loved Tyler. Mm. Then Tyler left, and then Hero left. So you became his soul, <laughs> like, his, his trophy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Even though you didn't want to be. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I built me. I built me. 
Like, you know what I mean? And, and Kevin built Kevin. No entity made us, you know. we, You know, Vince McMahon didn't come and dust, and dust us off and send us out there, and he made that character. I made me through my matches. He made him through his matches and character, right? The difference between me and him is Jim tried to harness what I had made and then, like, put his spin on it and then put me out there and be like, this is, you know, produced and, you know, directed by Jim Cornette, <laughs> whereas he got to go and just be himself. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I'm not holding any grudge. It, it is what it is, and so be it, you know. Um, but, uh... Yeah, that's and and that turned a, a lot of fans on me because my wrestling's never changed, you know. Yeah. yeah, it did because also people were getting sick of Jim being on every show. Like, you couldn't watch Ring of Honor so without seeing Jim Cornette two or three times. Yeah, yeah, and I, that and I totally agree. One of the times that you would see him was he would either do commentary for your match or oh, you know that what I mean? was? yeah, oh. he would just he was always he was always somewhere around Davey, you know. Even though, like like look, Davey didn't even know. He didn't notice that Jim would do commentary on almost every single match. Yeah. Even when you wrestled, was it Tyler? Was he back back? Yes. When you wrestled Tyler, uh, I, I wrestled Generico in the opening match. This was Toronto. Uh -huh. You wrestled Tyler, and Jim had come back by that point, and Pierce was still in control. And uh, you wrestled Tyler, and um, wait, am I wrong? I think I am wrong. Either way, I just remember that he would literally... Even when he wasn't in charge, he would make a point of convincing whoever was in charge to let him do commentary on your match. So, I, I don't. He, you know, yeah. he branded you with his name, yeah. even though you didn't were, even notice it. Were you surprised, like how quickly Cornet just left? I mean, it was maybe you no, saw. No, yeah. Kind of a, I, I, well, okay, so, uh, so we were at the um, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh yeah. and. Uh, when the wrestlers get banged up, because I have medical experience, I usually get called to go help them. So I did my match, and then I was uh, I was driving home, and I got a text that Carino had gotten hurt, and if I was in the building to come help him, you know what I mean? But I was already on the road, and I was like, no, oh, I'm sorry. And I just remember Lethal saying, yeah, Jim's flipping out, Carino's hurt, and that's all hurt. Not a big deal, nothing big. And then uh, <clears throat> I don't read the internet, so I don't know what the heck is going on, but I get there, and I'm like, where's Jim? I'm like, oh, Jim's gone. He's on like a permanent uh, hiatus, or he's gone and lived in the woods or some crap, I don't know, but, like, uh, and then that's, that's the last I've heard of him. I saw him getting mad about the curtain, me being where people yeah. could see, and that's the last I ever saw of him. Jim would just tend to have, uh, and this is the thing, uh, like I said, I didn't like Jim's booking, and I thought it was cheesy, but he would care, he cared about the boys, I'll say that. Like, he cared about the boys' well-being, and he wanted everybody to do good, he wanted everybody to be taken care of, yeah. Yeah. and he went out of his way to make that, the office do it, because sometimes the office didn't realize what they were doing, like I said, Growing pains was a term used, but I guess it was true. Like, uh, I don't know, they make mistakes that are kind of normal to make if you don't know any better. But Jim, instead of saying, hey, you guys, or maybe he did at first. You know, I don't know how long he was telling them, hey, make sure you guys do this, and you know, or make sure you guys don't forget this. To me, it seemed like he would just lose his fucking mind immediately. Boy, that's for dang And sure. get fucking... And, I mean, I, he has a history of that, like, for years, forever, for everywhere his work. He has a temper, and it fucking comes out like that. And it was just months and months of him losing his mind on various things, uh, mostly on, on the office, about stuff that, while being annoying a little bit, I don't think required him to lose his shit the way he did, but that's the way he handled things. And then that was the straw that broke the camel's back, is that TV taping, he got mad about a lot of things. And then uh, at the very end, Carino got hurt, the office guys had already left, and nobody was there to help. Like, he just wanted office people to be there to help. You know what I mean? But they weren't. Because truthfully, even if they had been there, what could they have done? Like... Fucking Greg or Joe aren't going to come strap Steve on the stretcher. It wouldn't have mattered if they were there or not. But Jim was just mad because he felt it was disrespectful that they had left or something like that. And he fucking lost his mind, like, oh, bad. He was really upset. And he, I guess, he fucking called some people and chewed out people, like, chewed out the wrong person for one time too many. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I also think it wasn't even them firing him or sending... I don't know what if he's fired. I don't know if he's still in the company. I don't know what the details are. But ultimately, he's not there now. And I think it was as much as as much his choice as it was theirs. I think for yeah. everybody, it was good to take a break or who knows what's going to happen. I don't know if there's plans for him to come back. I don't know if he even wants to come back. Yeah. But yeah. I think uh, that's basically what happened. He's just the straw that broke the camel's back was a wrestler getting hurt and Jim 
really being upset that the wrestler got hurt and he felt nobody's there to help him. So he, in a way, he was trying to do a really good thing. But I don't know, maybe he handled it. He handled it the way he knows how to handle things, and I guess the office thought right. he handled it wrong, and that's which. Which that being said, it's it's probably for the best on both fronts. He's not there anymore, uh, as much as for just how our company and the, the vibe it's you know being put out amongst the boys. But for him also, too, for he his was, own health. It was sometimes like you, yeah, he would get like this color. Yeah, like and instantly too, he would start yelling and fucking turn beat red, like not from yelling for ten minutes. He would turn beat red in an instant. Yeah. And, and he, like, fuck it, this guy is going to explode. Yeah, it was literally, it was literally zero to 60 to the point where I just got numb to it between like the whole... Yeah, like, that's it. I like, went every time became, I like, to go to Japan, oh, there he goes you know, again. Flip out, you know, everything <laughs> that I would think flip out. Every, everything flip out. You know, to Renz, I just kind of just turned off. I know, remember I, uh, an EMT, they brought the EMTs out for Steve. And as they were pulling him on the stretcher, Jim's losing his fucking mind, screaming at the top of his lungs about nobody in the office being there. Steve's hurt. He needs help. One of the MTs looked at me because I was next to Steve and goes, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, uh, well, that's our boss. <laughs> it's like, he's more on the show. Like, and he's like, keep that fucking guy away from yeah. me. I'm like, well, you're probably going to have to come back to get him soon. Look at the color he is. like, well, I'm going to send my fucking partner out because I ain't coming back to deal yeah. with this guy. <laughs> like, to somebody from the normal world, that was really insane. But to us, we were like, fuck, yeah, Jim's it's mad again. Norm. You know? It's, have uh, you, either of you had any communication with him since Pittsburgh? No, no not at all. No, none whatsoever. No, I don't think. I actually, I think I've heard that uh, somebody from Ring of Honor tried to get in touch with him, and he didn't even bother. Which like, is he probably for the best. Yeah, he, you know, he needs to step away from wrestling, I think. Yeah, and just go and enjoy life and enjoy the accomplishments that he's had. Uh, I don't want to talk specifically about any one guy, but, you know, really, Ring of Honor, we're talking about Gabe Sapolsky, Adam Pierce, uh, Hunter, and Cornette have all had a chance to be the booker here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you compare them, maybe as a group, and, and rate their positives, their negatives? I think, the Gabe's, liked? I think Gabe's positive, the strongest positive was that... Uh, this uh, this is where maybe me and Davey will will uh, have a different opinion, not about Gabe, but about wrestling. Like Davey uh, likes, and what what Davey likes in wrestling is competitive matches and and very like just great matches. And of course, I like that too. But I find moments are what matters in wrestling more than anything. I find moments are what will draw people to the product, and then they'll watch the matches. And some of those moments happen in matches. But uh, for example, me and Generico storyline. I didn't think of it as matches when I came up with it. I thought of it as moments. Like, how many great moments can we get, like, do? And Gabe was really good at those moments, I think. And he was great at making his product, like, seem special. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. to hype. He, and he's still good to this day. Uh, I think people have gotten used to it now because that's what Gabe does. But in Ring of Honor, you know, once in a while he'd post on the message board, like, hey, I just, you know, we just edited the DVD of this show and I watched, I don't know, Matt Seidel against Delirious, and what a special match that was. I'm really, really proud of those two guys, and you should make sure to check it out. And people will be like, oh, fuck, yeah, we'll check it out. And then they buy the DVD. So I think he was good at that, and I don't think any of the bookers uh, after him have had that, like yeah. that special way of making his product seem like something special. And then uh, Adam, uh, like I, I, told, I, I talked about Adam's strength in the past, too, on various interviews. He was willing... Like I said, at first it was a little rough because uh, his whole, you know, less is more mentality and old school and all that shit. But then I think he let go of that and he was willing to let the boys come up with stuff mm -hmm. and he would try to make it work. And I love that about Adam. Like, I, I, I said, I want to do this with Generico, Cabana, and Carino. Actually, Carino wasn't involved at the time, but Adam is the one who suggested Carino because we knew the fourth guy. And... He made everything happen. He, 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 he made sure that everything we needed, we had. And he did. He went out of his way to make it work, which was awesome. And he came up with some of the ideas too. But most of it was from us. And he had no problem with that. He didn't want to be the guy to be like, did you see the angle I booked? No, he was like, did you see fucking how hard those guys are working? Like, he, he loved it. If the product was working and things were good. And also, HD Net happened with Adam. And I think Adam was amazing at... Uh, directed like producing the show like he would be on the headsets the tapings he Screaming managed it everyone he would scream once in a while but <laughs> i think he was really good at it not as bad as jim yeah and then uh adam got let go 
for I think he was having differences with Sid. I think that was the main reason, honestly. Uh, and uh, or maybe not. I don't know. What's that off for? Because uh, uh, I'm. I'm literally the guy that shows up. I'm usually yeah, the last he, one to show he's up. He's not aware of any of this, leaves. I think. So, so this is all new information. This is all. And, and that guy you said. I mean, the, he knows. The, the Greg Gillespie guy. I have no clue who that is. I've never heard that name before. Who? I, yeah. I, I don't wonder who that is either. What's the name? Is that what you said? Did he's I say it right? No, you, you got his last oh, name. Oh, Greg. Oh, yeah. yeah Greg. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 See, I, still, yeah. I still know who you we're talking about. You don't know who he is. Right? Yeah, I don't know who he is. Yeah. I. Yeah. But yeah, like. I don't know. I, I know Adam and Sid weren't getting along, but I don't know if that's why he was let go or not. Or maybe Carrie just felt it was time for somebody else. I don't know. And then a Hunter came in and didn't have the chance to show what he could do because immediately almost Jim decided that he was taking over. Yeah. And then Jim booked, and uh, you know how I feel about that. I felt like as strong a char- character as he is and as uh, great a help he can be for uh, matches and promos... As far as angles and storylines are concerned, he's just not. It's just not what it, it, it. It's just not what it used to be, and I don't think he's. Not. I know he knows it. I just don't think he accepts it, which is probably why he had so many problems in TNA, and so many problems in WWE, and him and Vince Russo hated each other. And I'm not saying Vince Russo was a genius either. Obviously, he wasn't, but uh, it just wrestling's not what it used to be, and I don't think Jim likes it, and I don't think he wanted to give up on what he thought wrestling should be. Which, in a way, could be admirable, but, you know, depends on where you're looking at it from. And now Hunter is uh, finally able to create his vision, and uh, I think that's going really well, too. But it's kind of recent, so we'll see where it goes. It's too early to really pass judgment on Hunter right now? I think he's good. I think he's good, and he's also open to, like, suggestions. He's open to uh, help, which I think is really important when you're a booker. So I... My judgment so far is that he's good and it's he's going to do very well. And he's creative. That's the thing. you got to be creative. Adam will admit himself that he was not creative, which is why the boys coming up with stuff was so important. And then he would be really good at making it happen, like making sure it could happen. So And Jim, I don't think, was creative either because Jim would just really, like, just, he would literally fucking just yeah. pull angles out of Smoky Mountain and just do them in Ring of Honor, you know, so. I think, I think something that Gabe was really good at was uh, <clears> that, <throat> really convincing you that, that you were a star and you were the next big thing. You know he was I mean? good at making you he, and, he was good at making you feel like you matter. Yeah, and uh and, and he was also good at passing the torch and giving people the ball That's to true. run with. I mean he was very, very, very good at that. His downfall was his own ego. You know, and that because he really thought he was the mind, the machine and the means that made Ring of Honor so special. You know what I mean? Like and uh, and I know he carried that same and I'm sorry to say it, but it's a shoot interview, so you know, that he carried that same arrogance over to Dragon Gate and Evolved where he's like, well, I'm behind it. It's going to be successful. And it's like, you're one part of a machine. You, you know? know, I think uh, fans thought that too for a while. Like, I remember when they announced yeah, Evolved. Yeah, he convinced everyone of it. Like, uh, yeah. Like, people were like, oh, Gabe's starting something new. It's going to be amazing. And then when it wasn't, not because of Gabe, just it didn't end up catching lightning in a bottle the way Ring of Honor did originally when Gabe was doing it. Uh... I almost feel like people kind of, I don't know, people kind of almost, I remember I would read some message boards where people like making fun of Gabe out of nowhere. Because Gabe, I mean, it's a, it's a known fact that Gabe tends to fucking go online and sometimes he writes some weird shit or writes stuff that's kind of, to a lot of people, just makes no sense. Like, one of the things he does is, for example... He'll shit talk Ring of Honor, let's be honest, but then he'll still tag whatever tweets he's tagging, or I don't know if he does it anymore, but he used to. He would talk about Dragon Gate or Evolve and then hashtag it TNA WWE Arwitch. Well, it's just to get more people to read it. Yeah, but if you're talking shit about the company so bad, why are you using it to get your reviews? This is why I don't get like involved if Ring in social of, media. If Ring of Honor were to hashtag one of their tweets, well, Dragon Gate... not everybody Gate, can afford to you know, have someone do it for them. <laughs> yeah, if, right, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I, if Ring of Honor were to hashtag one of their tweets, DGUSA, I can bet you the next day there would be a blog about from Gabe about it. You know what I mean? Uh, but whatever, uh, that's just part of who Gabe is. But like Davey said, he's very talented at uh, yeah. At passing the torch is true. Like he, when yeah. he gets behind somebody, he gets behind someone yep. like full. Like he yeah. fucking believes in them, which is great. And I remember too, IWS, PCP Manny, you. Did you? Do, you never did either. Well, I, but I don't know so. Anyway, Manny, uh, I don't know why. One day asked me, "Why do you, do you think Gabe's a better Booker than I am?" I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Why?" 
Like, I don't know. One of the things, actually, Manny, is that when we come back from a match in your ring, you're not, you you don't say thanks, you don't give a shit. Yeah, and you're, you're giving, giving guys that. 10 bucks. The first face, and it's actually kind of funny I'm saying this because me and Gabe got into it about something I said regarding something like that. But the first face you'd see when you come back from a match at Ring of Honor when Gabe was in the round was Gabe because he wanted to say thank you, yeah. which always meant a lot. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And the one time he didn't do it, I mentioned recently uh, in like a little interview, somebody asked me, what's the thing you remember most about the ladder war with the Briscoes in Chicago? And I said, I remember coming back, Generico was hurt, and Gabe His was just... Yeah, and Gabe, that. all Gabe cared about was uh, the angle that was happening in the ring at the time, which was Jimmy Jacobs cutting the promo with Jay Briscoe's blood, like, pissing all over him. And Generico was, like, clutching his leg, and Gabe was just, like, fucking losing his mind over how great the shot was. And it was a great shot, but he didn't ask us how we felt. And for some reason, that's what I remember most. Not because I'm still mad at Gabe about it. I wasn't even mad then. But the, the guy asked me that. I said this, and Gabe saw it, and he was fucking hot. He was like, why would you say that? I'm like, just because that's the question. He asked me what's the thing I remember most, and that's what I remember most. I remember you losing your mind at Jimmy's thing while... We got to edit that. You got to okay. put a little bleep there. Uh, while Generico was clutching his leg, and you weren't... That, that said, that's what I remember. Because I, I remember it also because it was funny because you were looking at the TV like this and when Jimmy said his big finish line with generic arriving in pain there, you went, yes! So that's why I remembered it so well. Not because I think you're a piece of shit because every other match, you'd come to the back and Gabe was like, awesome, thank you so much. And I think that was one of the positives from Gabe. Well, do you, you know, sometimes at this level, and maybe Ring of Honor is at a different level because of the corporate structure, and maybe, and maybe Dragon's more hands-on than I think he is. Yeah. But having a, a booker that kind of controls things doesn't always help. PWG has been a, a phenomenal product for the last couple of years. Yeah. And a lot of what they get credit for is they let the wrestlers do the mm -hmm. wrestling. And they kind of let, give them the ball and go ahead. Yeah. Do you yeah. see that sometimes the booker gets in the way of, of maybe making that magic, making those moments? Uh, sometimes. I mean, I, I think that was a downfall of Jim Cornette. Is he told everyone how to be successful based on you know what he knew, which I'm sure you know when he was around it did work. You know what I mean? But no one knows. You know, only I know what I can do good and what I what I don't do as good as he does, as anyone does. It's individualistic. So, like, it's good for a booker to have you know. Uh, of the, a long-term view, but at the same time, you can't micromanage every single little thing because everything just becomes your view. You know what I mean? It becomes cookie cutter. I think, um, like, Dragon never gives anybody limitations. If yeah. anything, he wants you to... I mean, he'll never... I've never seen him... Uh, I mean, I guess I have seen him. Guys would come back for a match and be like, he's like, nah, like, I think that could have been, real, like, better. But he's never an asshole about it. And so I've seen him a million disco. times. Huh? Such a disco. Yeah, well, that's another story. Disco machine. <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> Is it worth telling now? Yeah. Mean, I've seen, Dude. I don't know what the story's going to say, but I've seen Disco Machine. Well, I tagged with him and, for a long time. Dragon, you know what I mean? And, yeah, uh, and so, okay, so. So I was not the asshole that I am now. I was once a very quiet and humble guy. was a real humble kid for Yeah, a while. oh yeah. Very naive. <laughs> so, you know, I'm saying, show up, gonna do my work, you know? Sir, how you doing? Anything to eat? All right, no problem, you know? Great. And back to myself, nice to have yeah, It was like that. Yeah, you have to show three hours early, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, know, you show up three minutes after bed. Yeah, imagine that, right? Anyway, so, uh, I tag, which is, which is the, by far and away the hugest thing that happened to me up until that point, you know yeah. what I mean? By far, you know? Um, and, uh, and one of the tag teams we worked was Excalibur and, and Disco Machine. And, uh, and, you know, and I remember vividly we had this match, and, uh, they, and like, at the time, I'm so caught, you can probably help me explain this, because you're better articulated than me, uh, like, there, there's a time when you're wrestling when you're so caught in the match, I don't want to screw this up, I just want to do my job, but you're not really focused on what everyone else is doing in the match, you're just focused on your part, am I, am I explaining that right? Yeah. So, I think we're having this match, and it's going good, the crowd's digging, we're rocking and rolling, okay, but I kind of noticed they are saying, like, you know, even you know, Scott was like, tag me in, you stupid piece of shit. And, like, you know, <laughs> Super Dragon Singer, I have to edit that, too. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, worst, yeah, worst catch ever, you know what I mean? And I was like, okay. And then I get up there, and, and I come up, and I come up and back. 
You know, and I'm hey, hey, oh, hey, good match, man. All right, cool, yeah. And I don't see Mike Disco, uh, Disco Machine. I'm like, all right, no big deal. Well, where we were, there was there was there was the locker room. You go on this big roof, and it's California, so everyone sits on the roof. You know what I mean? It's all good. And I go out there, and I just get, whew, get some air. You know, because it was been like 25 minutes, and I see Mike over there, and he's crying, and I'm like. Oh, sh- and my first thing is, oh, Mike shit. Mike is Mike's Disco there. Machine, by the way. Just yeah. So you guys know. Yeah, I'm sorry. And so I go over there. Oh, Mike, y'all right? He's like, nobody likes me here. And I'm thinking, like, nobody likes me. And I was like, no, that I, th- I thought it was good because, you know, hey, I didn't know. You know what I mean? And like, oh, oh my God, make that guy cry and cry. And I felt terrible. And even his own partner. And then I go watch a match back on DVD, which is how long ago this was. <laughs> and uh, got the whole match. Just, God, you're a dumbass. You're an idiot. Right in the match. I'm just like, oh, man. Because uh, Disco, great dude. Wonderful so human nice. being. But in the ring, sometimes he would tend to get a little lost. But then, instead of trying to settle himself and find where he's at, he would try he would like try to make up for being lost and just make shit worse. And then it would just become a huge debacle. Yeah, yeah. He was fast. And uh, in that match, it happened. And Dragon, while he, like, while this goes crying, Dragon goes up to him and I, see, I, I saw the same thing you said. This guy's crying, sitting on a chair like this. Remember his back was at the very end. Yeah, right? yeah, it was dramatic. Yeah. And because we, like you said, we were like, it was weird. The JCC was a big building, like this kind of, like this warehouse almost, but it was a community center. Then you went up the stairs where the locker room was, and then when you walked out of the door, one of the doors out of the locker room would go outside to a staircase, so you go back down to the parking lot. Or you went through the other door, and it, it led to a roof, because next to the community center was a daycare. So you were on the daycare's roof. Like, you walked 20 feet, and you could jump into, like, 10 feet down to a playground yeah. where the kids would play. Yeah, it was that was nice. Basically. It was a California evening. It yeah, so nice. we hung out on the roof after match just to cool down. But it was really dramatic. Like, you open the door, and all the way at the end, sitting in a corner right at the edge of the roof, was Disco on a chair like this. with And, like, the street lights was kind of hovering over him, so it was real it dramatic. It reminded me, you remember the last scene of the Blair Witch Project when he goes down and he finds that guy or the lady standing <laughs> yeah, in the corner? Was, it was something that was kind of like that, okay? <laughs> then I see Dragon walk over, and Dragon's got the, the same walk every time, and he's just shaking his head no. And I'm like, oh, man. And I see him walk. Mike, Dragon's like, dude, what happened? (laughs) (laughs) He's not crying. He's like, no, no, what happened? Why are you crying? (laughs) And that was it. He was just even. He didn't give a shit that he was crying. He had to know why. But why'd you fuck that up? And it's not even the the only time he cried. I remember one time. Yeah, he would cry a lot. Something happened. He fucked up. I think it was him and Aries at Bola, and he didn't catch Aries on a dive, maybe. And that was a big match because Dragon would never put Disco in high-profile matches. Right. But for that bola, he needed somebody, so he gave Disco a match with Ares, which was his biggest opponent in a long time. Yeah. So Disco was fucking psyched. And for what it's worth, I thought the match was all right, but it didn't go super well. Disco cried after. And I always remember this sight. Generico was teaming Quicksilver at the time. And Quicksilver was at the show. I don't even know if he was wrestling. He might not have been. Or this might actually have been another match where Disco was crying. I just know Quicksilver was there and Generico was there too. And as Mike is crying in the corner, uh, I'm sitting there. I'm like sitting Indian style, just doing whatever. And I look up and Generico and Quicksilver are standing next to me. And Quicksilver's going, look at him, Generico. He's always crying. And Generico starts to laugh. Like he's trying not to laugh. And Quicksilver's like whispering in his ear, no, no, look at him. Everybody hates wrestling him all the time. And Generico's like trying not to fucking laugh out loud as Mike is crying there. And Quicks and he's trying to pull away. Quicksilver's holding him by the other. No, look, look at him. He's crying still. He's a grown man. And Generico's dying. And then I'm laughing because dude, it's just craziness. He would have been always one that remember we'd always go out to IHOP afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then he would always take me to the airport. And like, you know, most of the time he'd be like, oh yeah, man, okay, you come back, yeah, I'm coming back next month, man. And there was something. <laughs> and, there, and after that time, I dragged it off, he goes, you know, man, if I didn't have to like run the lights and do everything, I just don't have time for these matches and I just can't keep doing this. I'm thinking like, I'm thinking like, guess, well, but that's yeah, I thought enough, it was great, I man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, and to be honest with you, I wasn't lying. I thought it was fine. I think you he wanted, I mean? also, I think what he wanted desperately is Dragon's approval because he looked up to Dragon 
And getting Dragon's approval is not that easy. And especially yeah. when the thing is, Dragon would work with him on PWG, and it was a stress. Like the days of the show was stressful. Like yeah. you said, sound uh, system, the lights, everything. Yeah. Mike had a lot of outside. Yeah, stuff and I think play. just uh, Dragon. I don't know. It would just. It would culminate in uh, ultra high standards. Uh, dragon. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, I'm sorry. Okay. Super Dragon has very high standards. Um, but I don't think they're unreasonable. And no, I think but, that's but, why PWG is so great too. Yeah, but but at the same time, he'll he's got no problem letting you know when no. when they're not up to his standards. And uh, it's funny you mentioned something about driving to the airport, and this is a story I thought from years ago that I wanted to tell. And this, I, you can confirm it because I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, one time, you remember Joey Ryan's ex girlfriend who used to hang Which around one? all the wrestlers, the one that. Uh, she would just. She was always at John's house, Top Gun. Remember, and she drew, She she would wear the stupid beads around her neck. You remember her? Anyway, this is a story I heard. Uh, she was driving you to the airport one day, one morning, and you were just sitting there not talking because why would you talk to her? And she wasn't dating Joey anymore. And she turned to you and said, "I can blow you if you want." And I heard that your answer was, "Turned up the volumes." Drive on. And that was it. That's all you guys said. Do you have a different story? I think she did blow him. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's not the We're not moving story on. I heard wasn't really good. Good. So, remember we'd all go, uh -huh. so remember we'd all go and hang out at Top Gun Tall Wars house. Yes. And uh, I heard she made many a victim in that, uh, in that little bed in the side room. <laughs> good old DR. El Generico was also a victim. She once, oh, good. Okay, so I don't feel so oh, bad. Oh, no, don't worry about it. She once woke up Quicksilver with a hand job, but he, when he went to sleep, she wasn't in the bed with him. And then he woke up to her grabbing his dick, and he was like, hey, hey, what the fuck? And he kicked her out. He's like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I just thought you'd, you'd enjoy it. What the fuck? Get out. Which I think is considerate. Yeah, so... Uh, well, Quicksilver had a girl at that point, and he didn't want nothing to do with oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, uh... I once violently beat up Joey Ryan in front of her. She was sitting in the front row. And um, she was still dating him at the time. But they had dated on and off. And during the off period, she spread her charm to a lot of the boys, I guess. And as I was, be and I hated her because I, I hate girls like that. As I was viciously beating on Joey in front of her, I believe I grabbed Joey by the hair, and this is on DVD, looked at him, and she was right there, and in front of her just went, Look at your fucking whore, Joey! <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, he didn't mind. Uh, Joey's down. You're always good at that. Remember that time I screwed up cutting my hair and we wrestled? Oh yeah, I pointed it out. You you're, like, spot you're like, look at him give himself a haircut. And I felt like the biggest idiot. He shaved his head, head except he, there's a big spot. I was in a really big hurry to miss the spot. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was. A, I just wanted to bring up that story. I guess the story I heard was uh, not. I mean, it might have happened that way, but then later she she caught you. Yeah, no yeah. wonder everybody wanted to go to PWG for so long. Yeah, it was, yeah, because you go there and you say, hang out at Tall Wars house, and then she would come there and, you know, handle your woes. And... That is not why people like doing it. <laughs> Tom Gunn's house was awesome before she Yeah, yeah, it. yeah, it was a perk. I want to ask you a serious question. Okay. How much pressure is there when you're Ring of Honor World Champion, you got, you know, a big show, whether it's high pay-per-view or, or, or whatnot? Uh, Nigel, in his documentary, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to watch that. He, he admitted to he had a, he had a lot of, mm -hmm. of self-imposed pressure being the champion. Right? Yeah, a ton. Uh, I, I'm, I'm extremely uh, uh, confident. No, no, nowhere more in life confident when it comes to, to wrestling. Um, and uh, on my track record is I've produced time and time and time and time again. And then when you win the title, man, I remember when, I, when they told me I was winning the title against Eddie, and it was like, it's the same thing. You know, it could have been a more familiar atmosphere, you know what I mean? I was doing the same thing I'd always done against someone who I knew was great, who knew my style better than anyone else. And it was like, whew, whew, okay, okay. And it's I remember seeing it in you, you know what I mean? And then, like I remember talking to Nigel and even Brian about this. Like, it does something to you, man. It's like it all becomes a, a little too real. I'm probably not finding the right words. And he'll, probably, he'll probably explain it better than me, but it's a ton of pressure, man. Um, just because uh, for me personally, it was... I I I cared a lot about what what the other wrestlers thought of me, and that was my big thing. That was my biggest thing. Um, that that was the biggest source of pressure I put on myself was, you know, had I just gone in with the mentality of like 
just keep doing what you're doing because what you've been doing has obviously been working. And I thought like, oh, I, gotta do, I have to erase everything. I got to get new gear. I got to do all this new stuff and da da da. da. And uh, and it, it didn't work. You know, what I mean, it, you, you know, it's if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Kind of a thing. Well, it wasn't broke, and I definitely tried to fix it. And I uh, and I way overbooked myself as far as travel. And uh, so it was uh, try to conquer the world, man. You kind of found uh, you just human being at the end of the day. That was my personal journey. In it. Yeah, I think we had a different journey as champion. I I, I was nervous the night I won it, um, but once I won it, first of all, the I pay per view was real fucked that night. And uh, I think that made me realize that, you know what, why be nervous about something that if I'm doing the best I can, other factors might fucking, you know, fuck it up anyway. So every title defense I'd have, I didn't see, like, I had to have a classic match the way you probably did. No, absolutely. I, I saw as, I'm going to do what I do, and they're either going to like it or not. But the pro not the problem, I mean, the advantage that I have, not that it's not the same with you, but... I I don't know if I'm making this up in my head or not, but I think I have a genuine relationship with the fan, like my fans, like the fan base. I literally think I, it's weird. I feel like I know my fans and yeah. I know they're going to be behind me. Like even if I don't have a classic match, I know the next day they're still going to be fans of mine. That's for me and you definitely differ because I, I, I think I live and die with my matches, whereas like if if I don't have good matches, people couldn't care less about seeing me. I feel differently. I don't know, man. I, no, I don't that's know great. If, I'm jealous of that. <laughs> but I think I have. I don't know what it is. I don't. Honestly, I don't know. Maybe it's because uh, a lot of fans can relate to me because I'm not a fucking dude who works out all the time. I'm not. Perhaps. I don't know, dude. And I I don't know. I spend a lot of time on Twitter answering fans questions like from fans and. I've literally not become friends with fans, but now there's a lot of fans that I know, like I know by name because, oh yeah, that dude bought a shirt from me and I remember he tweeted at me like, hey, I got the Steen shirt and then he'll tweet at me later about a match he saw and I'll answer him and then I feel like I almost develop a rel like relationship with fans through that. That's and great. I, it is great in yeah. a way because I, I, feel like, I feel like they, I don't know, it's weird. I feel like they have faith in me and mm -hmm. even if I don't have a classic match one day, I think they'll give me cut me a break for it. Yeah, you know I, I, mean? I don't think they will with me, just because I'm so. But I think, but they do. I think they do. The, I and think you're just harder on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely harder on myself, but I also realize that I'm very socially awkward, and I don't feel comfortable like talking to people I don't know and stuff. So I kind of come off as just like, you know, like where they can like relate to you on a personal level and you know see you as like a friend. I'm just I'm just the wrestler, and if the wrestler yeah. doesn't do the wrestling, well then fuck off. Yeah, I mean I think I get that too from the meet and greets that we've been doing in the Ring of Honor. Perhaps. Uh, like yesterday, I was at that show Gibsonville, and I was sitting at my merch table by myself at an intermission and before the show, and I talked to I don't know hundred fans maybe, and I I literally I I didn't just sign my name and say thanks. I talked to them about it, and they talked to me, and it's weird. I think people have a they're very they can talk to me easily and I've talked like those dudes tell me about I get emails from fans saying I've gotten emails from fans saying hey I just uh, my, I lost my friend in a car accident and he was a huge fan of yours and I just want you to know that uh, you know since he died I, I've been watching your stuff and I find comfort in that because I miss my friend That's and great, I man. and stuff like that That's is great. it means the world to me and yeah. I, I take the time to answer those people and I don't know I feel like I, I don't know I maybe this is really cheesy, I guess. Cornet would love it, but uh, I don't know. I feel like I have really good fans, and I, uh, I feel like they care about me. They actually care about me. No. I'm not just like if I feel like if I something were to happen to me, they wouldn't be like, oh, in two weeks, oh well, fucking Steen's hurt now. Let's move on to some other guy. I, they'd still care. And that's you know, me. Kevin, if, a, if a, someone from the outside just read your Twitter for the first time, they may take away a different perception of how much you care about your fans. Meaning how? Well, maybe your inter your interaction with them sometimes you you know you'll talk down to them and Who? I know a lot, a lot of it's I'll it's talk down. To, I mean, I'll talk down to idiots and I'll make jokes with fans a lot, which might be misconstrued for people who don't know me. Like, that's another thing. I feel like my fans know me on a very personal level. Like I'm a smart ass, and a lot of them get it. You know, uh, I don't know why you saying it just sparked a lot of the reasons why I'm so bitter at Ring of Honor, but um. Uh, Ring of Honor wanted me to do the Twitter thing for me and Eddie's match. I don't have any interest in that kind of stuff. My thumbs are too big to type on that damn thing anyways. Uh, which you've seen plenty of times. But, uh, like, uh, I've literally uh, 
poured my heart in, into into what I was and and opened up and you know what people don't realize about me is the stuff I talked about uh, whether my divorce my grandparents dying and stuff was stuff that was me the first time in public to anyone talking about that kind of stuff and I felt like you know that was a real coping mechanism for me to get over that and I'm moving forward and winning the title was like significant it was I, I've said it before and I've said it again it was I could care less about having the shiny gold belt I could it doesn't matter to me at all it was just like it was closure to a lot of things in my past like all that was meant for something because there was a lot of nights man I can remember a lot of nights in Japan going man why am I here like my grandparents my family my past has been erased and what do I have to show for it you know what I mean and now I had this goal that I could I have this to show for it and then I feel like Ring of Honor uh, really just kind of like well you know just yeah but you know go out there and make him look the guy doesn't care about this you know he just wants to go to Japan he doesn't care about his fans he doesn't care about this kind of stuff here and that's where I just kind of like you said I seen probably I probably seemed, did seem slightly like off kilter or maybe you know you know very off kilter and very bitter because I was very hurt you know and then uh, uh, Kevin's a lot better at showing emotions and being more comfortable with emotions and stuff than I am uh, but that I don't know this has nothing to do with what he's talking about I understand but it just really sparked something that reminded me of why I was so uh, angry and bitter at the time um, I got really off track there sorry but yeah no, I just it, like I said, my mind goes in and out. <laughs> you got to catch it when it's on. Have you guys watched the Nigel? I have. I watched it with him, actually. Uh, I've seen bits and parts, and, and to be honest, man, uh, a lot. Of, I turned it off because it was really, it was really depressing. It was hard to. I thought it was incredibly well done, and I yeah. was. I told Nigel, I'm amazed that you made this. Like it was well produced. The music is amazing. The uh, it's like a movie, but one part in it where he gets really mad. And he's in his car. He gets really mad and kind of loses it, and he cries a little, and he's just he's angry, and he vents about what happened to him. That part for me was really hard to watch because I was sitting next to him, and it felt, it got like it was heavy in the room, you know, because we were watching it with other wrestlers, and it was heavy in the room, and I felt like, I you don't you don't really know what to say because he was dealt a really shitty hand, and. I've even seen people now comment on it on like message boards and stuff like that where they say, well, he should have just paid the six grand and gotten the surgery. But it's not, I asked them that same question after, why didn't you just pay the six grand and get the surgery? Or it might have been more than six grand, I don't know, but he had a valid reason why he didn't. And I'm not going to say it here because it's Nigel's deal and I'm sure he'll be asked about it eventually and he, he can touch on it too, but it wasn't that simple. It wasn't just like, oh, well, if I pay and get my arm repaired then i'm gonna go on to wwe and make a lot of money it wasn't that easy it just wasn't well he admitted it wasn't a for sure thing it wasn't like they said, it. if you get it yeah then you're right. in yes but it, there's even more to it yeah. than that and um but i really enjoyed his documentary and i will say this i think that the pressure that he put upon himself in a lot of ways is a lot like the pressure davy put on himself too uh so i understand that but they're different animals than i am in the sense that I take pride in my wrestling, but I, like I said, I take pride into the moments I can create. They take pride in their matches. Like, their matches are their art. It's their babies in a way. Nigel's the same way, you know? Like, those matches that he had, he's extremely proud of them. And I'm also proud of the matches that I have, but I almost think of, as a, it's just, it's a different, I have a different mindset than them. And if I had the same mindset as them, maybe I'd be a better wrestler. Uh, maybe a lot crazier, though. So you're doing it right. No, but I'm just saying I uh, I don't know. I take away what I take away from wrestling. Like the the what fulfills me in wrestling is different from what from f fulfills them. And I think that's why they put that pressure on themselves. And I kind of don't. I I do put my I I, I have pressure. Like I want to make sure my matches are are good and entertaining. They want like their matches. They want their matches to be perfection. Best. Yes, exactly. I don't look for perfection. I look for when I'm done. I want to be able to say. I worked hard, people enjoyed themselves, and everybody's going home happy. Nobody's saying that fucking match was awful. Or if somebody's saying it, 99% of the time it's one or two dudes, and there's like fucking 100 people. For those two dudes, there's 100 people saying, hey, that was a fucking blast. Like, people don't come up to me and say, that was, like, it's happened. I wrestled Elgin in Toronto, and some people said that was a fucking classic. I'm like, okay, but I'm not used to hearing that. I'm used to hearing, hey, man, that was a fucking blast. You know what? That's great i love hearing that but nobody's gonna tell me you had a five-star match 
but they'll, those guys would hear it, and I think the, the the quest for those matches, the quest for that is what puts the pressure on, yeah. on oh, you absolutely. or Nigel or so many. Like Elgin, I know for a fact, Elgin, if he ever wins that title, he's going to be just like you and Nigel. Yeah. He thrives for that five-star match. Everybody's different, and you need you need guys from both ends. You need the guys that want to have classic matches. You need the guys that just want to have fun. Look at Generico. I think Generico is probably the best wrestler in the world, but I know he was never after a five-star match. He was after a fun match and people being happy. And fuck, did he ever do that better than anyone else? Another uh, issue that was brought up from the Nigel documentary yeah. is this, he he is against unnecessary uses of blood. Yeah. Did watching that documentary change oh your perception God. of it? Me, yeah, big time. Davies never bled on purpose in a wrestling ring. Yeah. I have many times. Never. And um, never will either. What happened was, I I don't know. I I didn't do it till for years. Like I was in 2005. I think I did it for the first time in IWS, and I you know I got a little trickle. And then I did it against Super Dragon and Guerrilla Warfare, and again I got a little trickle. And then, I don't know why, uh, I'm like, fuck, I'm not really good at this, so I'm not going to do it. And then one time, we, uh, this guy was debuting at IWS, and the first thing he was going to do was attack me with a chair. And I was like, eh, I kind of want to make this guy's debut a big deal, so I think I'll try to get another, uh, another, you know, blade job or whatever. And I, that one, I nailed. It was insane. Like, I was pissing blood. And I work like the next month. The guy came out, and fucking people were like afraid of him, even though everybody knows how stupid we are. Like they know why I was bleeding. They know what happened. But I was like, oh man, so blood. I know blood works. And even when I was a kid, and fucking oh, one of the wrestlers is bleeding. Like it was always a big deal. Like that Steve, that image of Austin bleeding when Brad has a sharpshooter on, you know. And then when I did the feud with Generico. I felt like, fuck it, let's go all out. And I, I must have gigged that 10 times that year and just, you know, fucking gushers. And I thought it was fine. I don't know. I, I felt like it was weird. In Ring of Honor, I felt like I was being different. And I've always wanted to be different. So it was just part of trying to be different. And um, then Nigel, uh, you know, there was some ambiguity as to what was happening with Nigel. Everybody was, you know, everybody was... Uh, talking about these rumors and nobody really knew and I wasn't talking with Nigel at the time anymore just because we, you know, we'd just grown apart. He was doing his thing, I was doing my thing. And Then uh, in December of this last year, right before Final Battle, Nigel called me and said, well, this documentary is coming out and this is, this is what happened to me. And he told me about it. And he told me, he's like, listen, I know you're the champion now and I know you do a lot of hardcore stuff because that's how they, you know, that's how it's booked. But I think you should uh, really be careful as to bleeding in the ring and all that stuff. And I had already, like, started to think that way a little bit. Like, I remember a couple months before, we were wrestling and one guy wanted to bleed. And out of respect, I won't say who it is, but one guy wanted to bleed. And I wasn't comfortable with him bleeding while I was in the ring. Because as much as I like the guy, I kind of don't know where he's been. And he bled anyway. And the problem was, I cut my finger during that match before he started bleeding and then he bled and the whole match I was trying to keep my fucking finger away from him because I, I didn't want like I, I knew he was probably fine but I just didn't even want to take that chance so that seed was already planted in my head and then when Nigel told me uh, you know what happened to him he was like you should be careful and to me it resonated more than you should be careful it was like you know what and also it's happened where my you know my wife would go to school and her friends would say, what does your husband do? It was like, oh, he's a pro wrestler. Oh, really? They look me up on YouTube. And when you look my name up on YouTube, most of the time, the first thing that happens is a promo of mine where I'm pissing blood from like a Chicago show. And they would ask her, oh, my God, what happened to him? And my wife would say, oh, well, in wrestling, sometimes they have to make each other, you know, they make themselves bleed. That notion to normal people, like, uh, what? How? How? Oh my God, what? And then when she would tell me about those reactions, I was like, in a way, like, I'm stupid, <laughs> it's kind of cool. But it's not fucking cool at all. Like, it would be like, oh man, they're kind of right, you know? It's fucking retarded. And then uh, some other guys like Davey had that notion right away. They were, you know. I'm just so surprised good. that you never did, because we've seen a lot of the DVD covers where I guess you, you did bleed somewhere during the match. And Yeah, I mean, I've been cracked a million times. Yeah, that's and, it. And, I mean, he uh, eats butts and kicks to the face. Yeah, I got a hard head. Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, no, I've bled plenty of times, uh, but like I've always been, and this is completely in for better or for worse. Uh, my personal philosophy is like, if I'm gonna bleed, I'd rather, I'd rather get from a real thing than like yeah. I, I'm very I'm. It's weird, man, but like you know, like stick, I get paid to stick needles in people, but for me to cut myself is like not gonna happen at all. And uh, but yeah, I bled plenty of times by getting head butted uh, or, or just whatever you know what happens in the you know that happens in the going on to the ring and everything. But uh, yeah, as far as me cutting myself, never. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even know how to make a blade. I wouldn't know how to hide. I would not do that. none of that. None of it. Yeah. So that's what happened. I mean, I had that reaction she would tell me about it and she wasn't super comfortable with it either my wife you know but whatever she let me do it and then I remember one thing that Nigel said is specific I, I was already on board with not doing it anymore but then I, I don't know how it happened but in that feud in 2010 with Generico and I worked with Cabana I would do this spot I did it twice with Cabana where it was just literally to shock people which is you know Davey said I would do and it's true I he would get color and I'd fucking lick his blood off his forehead, because it was cold. I didn't mind. I didn't care because it's cold. And Nigel said, "Well, would you have felt comfortable doing that with me?" I'm like, "Yeah, probably, because you're my friend." It's like, "Yeah, well, if you had done that with me at a certain time, now you'd be sick or you would have gone sick." Yeah. And I was like, wow. "Holy shit!" You know, like that's fucking true. And that's what made it for me now that I, I'm never gonna do that again. And I, or actually, I can't say that. Maybe I will. But if I do, I will choose where I do it a lot wiser, and I'll be a lot smarter about it. But also, there's there's another reason why I don't want to do it anymore is because it's fucking stupid. Everybody knows what you're doing. There's always that second from the impact to when the blood comes where everyone knows what's happening, and it's stupid. Everybody literally just goes, we're just going to pretend that didn't happen, and that the other thing is why you're bleeding. And then I realized it's dumb, it's fucking dangerous, it's kind of crazy, the people that live a normal life, so why do it? And then I want to support Nigel and what he's trying to do, because I believe in it. So uh, I, before Final Battle, at Nigel's suggestion, Generico and I both went to get tested to make sure we didn't have uh, hepatitis or anything like that, and in a way I was happy to do it, because I was kind of worried that maybe that dude's blood from months ago... You know, and I was, I'm happy to report I am a clean, healthy person. So there you go. But, you know, and I did that because Nigel suggested it. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to create awareness for guys to, one, stop doing that. And two, like Davey said, blood will happen sometimes because it happens. Yeah. So he, guys should be more safe about it. Yeah. Get vaccinated, Absolutely. get tested, yeah. stuff like that. And I think Nigel's uh, doing a really good thing. And I hope guys, uh, like, I, I'm, again, I don't want to speak for Nigel because I'm sure he's going to do something like this eventually. If it's not with iSpot, it's going to be with somebody else or an interview or something like that. There, there is nobody else, but go ahead. You know what I mean. <laughs> it's a one-stop shop here, Wink. Kevin. No, but I meant, like, interviews online or so whatever. He did an interview with Meltzer. If he's ever going to do another one, I don't want to tell his story for him. But I remember a couple weeks ago he told me that he went to a show where somebody, like, he's friends with a promoter, and the promoter told him, like, come to the show, and then I want you to show your documentary to my wrestlers. Yeah. But on that show, and I guess he was going to show the documentary the next day, on that show, there's a big blow-off to a feud, and both the wrestlers got color. And I was like, why'd you bring me here? Yeah. It's completely against what I'm trying to do. He, he's definitely trying to, to um, raise just the, the, just the status quo of wrestling, which needs to be done. I mean, we're living in a day and age... Where like yeah yeah guys are getting you know uh, incurable diseases from from wrestling and, and everyone's doing the gigging you know what I mean from the backyard to the big stadiums and we're having people getting beat up in matches now they're suing other people are calling the cops on people <laughs> it's getting out of hand and basically the, the premise that I've talked to Nigel about is wrestling needs some regulating body you know what I mean I think every wrestler should have to be licensed you know in every state just because um, the, the it's professionalism you know that's really what it is you know what I mean if you're good at what you do and you've honed your craft. You know what I mean? Then, then you shouldn't need to do things like that. And then, or at the very least, when you do do it, it should be such a rare occurrence. Like, wow, man, wow. Whereas now, it's like, hey, you see that he did, he did the thing. I remember, yeah. That's a that's what's you know so what I mean. And that's too. and that's you know and that's what we're coming to. You know, because people got no business being in the ring. Uh, <clears throat> Um, are, are just, you know, seeing this and, and they can figure it out and they go out and they do it. You know what I mean? And when someone gets hurt, it's like, well, 
well, you, I didn't know this actually took skill or like, this, you know, I have to be trained to do this. Like, well, yeah, yeah. I remember, it's kind of vaguely on the topic actually, but I remember uh, one time years ago, a fan sent me a tweet saying, hey, look at this, I did this for you. I'm like, okay. Oh, Christ. Click the link. It's, the video is just, it's a couch. It's black and white and it's just a couch. And my music, my theme music starts. And then this guy appears, shirtless. He sits down on the couch. And pantsless. My song is playing, and he fuck, I see him go do this. Oh man! Starts bleeding. Hell on. my theme music. And that's the video. The rest of the video is him staring, <sighs> bleeding, and at the bottom is like kill Steam, kill that. And I was like, whoa, my God, what is this fucking nut? And then that's it. Like I turned off the video and I didn't even think about it twice. I was like, well, this guy's an idiot. But then later on. All that shit came back, and I remember this video, and I was like, well, you know, he did this because he knows that's what wrestlers do. And, you know, that's goes with what Davey's saying. It's just, it's leading, it's, it's a wrong example to give for one thing, and two, fucking, some people just don't know what they're doing and act insane, and a lot of them end up wrestling for some reason. So, you know, yeah, who knows? And- Maybe that guy's in fucking wrestling now doing this all over the place and god knows what he's got and just stuff like that so yeah man nigel's thing the documentary to go back to the actual documentary is pretty hard to watch and it's it's sad what happened to him but now i feel like but he's vital good... what's that but vital to wrestling i think yeah but i mean also the problem with his arm and not getting his contract yeah, yeah, it's very yeah, upsetting yeah. in a way but it's also great because uh, i think now he's in a good place and he's yeah. He's, ha- he, he's made his peace with it and that's comforting yeah because absolutely. if I knew he was still struggling with it I I wouldn't have enjoyed the DVD you know what I mean right I have that knowledge that now he's in a good place so now I can enjoy his 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 work which the documentary is he put so much time in absolutely. so I think a lot of people should try to go out of there and watch it yeah absolutely you know the one thing that bothers me though is mm. it seems like as a fan you know for me and I know everything you said is wrong right. And I, and I agree 100% all the things that are wrong about it. But it just seems like blood in wrestling when it's used right does yes. mean something. I agree, but the yeah. thing It'd be is... like porno without... You know, they're talking about porno and everybody wearing condoms. It's like not the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and, and and because they could not... Well, my, I'm so grateful. My grandma's not here to see this. The reason that... They don't use condoms anymore in pornos. It's because they've raised just the the status quo. Like, no, if you want to do this, you have to do this. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I absolutely agree with you. I, I, I'm never going to believe. I, 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 there's no problem about it. Not going to happen. Uh, but I do agree with you 100%. But it needs to be used in the right way at the right time by qualified people. You know yep. what I mean? In, in, in a sanitary environment. environment. It, it can't, it, but it's, it's, going, it's going in the exact opposite direction where it's like, you know, I mean, as we speak right now, somewhere in the world or someone in the backyard with their friends cutting their head open. It's happening right now. You know, and that's what needs to end. I'm not saying blood needs to go. The people doing it need to be reduced drastically. I mean, in a way, I think that's true. But I think Nigel, in his mind, I think Nigel thinks blood needs to go. And I kind of, I agree with him. You're right, when blood is you, and I, I can't even say that I'll never do it again. And I think Nigel would probably be upset if he heard me say this. Because... I, he sold me on it. Not he sold me on it, but I, I agree with him. I believe in what he's doing. But even I can't say, um, I probably will, I'll never do it again. I'm like, eh, I don't know. But, and I think that would upset Nigel, and that's part of why Nigel, like, I've talked to Nigel about this, is he's trying to get through to people. And to go back to what I was saying, the promoter brought him to show that to his wrestlers, but then that night he had guys bleeding in his ring. And when Nigel said, well, what, what's the point of being, being here? The promoter's like, oh, no, but they got tested. That's not the message Nigel's trying to bring. It's not, it's okay to bleed if you're tested. It's get tested so you're sure you don't have anything, so that if it happens, if you get cut, like Generico and I are gonna have the ladder match. Ladders can scratch you. If you bleed, you know you're okay. It's not, oh, oh, I got tested now so I can fucking, yay! You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people in wrestling just didn't get that part. And uh, that's what he's hoping to change. But I think that's where it's going to be difficult because it's ingrained in people, even me. Yeah. I can't even say that. I'm never going to do it again. And I'm Nigel's friend, and I truly feel for him, and I truly believe in what he's doing. But even I can't guarantee I won't do it. And whether you support it or not, there's so many wrestlers that if you took that away from them, they're really no, no one's going to be interested in seeing it. Yeah, and it's also an old-school mentality. Like, For a lot of people that have been doing this for so long, 
I, I, Nigel told me, a wrestler that we all like, we all respect, and I won't name because out of respect, like a good dude, a smart man in Ring of Honor, uh, like he's he's a talented wrestler, he doesn't need to bleed, but he uh, he was planning on bleeding for a match. Nigel said, "Why you watch my document? Like why?" And his answer was, "Oh no, but it's okay. I got te I got tested." Or so Nigel's like, "Well, you know." And Nigel's telling me the other day he's a little disheartened because he doesn't know. I think he knows he's raising awareness, but he feels like maybe it's. It's going nowhere at the same time. But I told him, well... well it's not going to change overnight. That and also, I think the new generation of wrestlers are going to get it a lot more. It's hard to stop doing something you're used to doing. But if you've never done it and you get the information immediately, then you're better prepared to <clears throat> not do it. Do you understand what I mean? I think there's more cases, like you were saying, people are suing over this, people are contracting yeah. viruses. I think... Yeah. That coupled with Nigel putting it down on TV. Yeah, because Nigel's the one that's spreading the awareness to that. That's the thing, and that's why that's his goal. But yeah, it happens a lot. Like, it happens not all the time, but it's been happening. And just the fact that it's happening once or twice is fucking appalling as it is. It's so, being integrated into like the D.A.R.E. curriculum in like sixth grade schools across <laughs> the country. So I think that's Nigel's, uh, if anything, Nigel's legacy is going to be that maybe not our, he's, he made an impact on our generation or whatever of wrestlers in that at least the guys are aware that I should get tested or vaccinated, yeah. but they might still keep doing it. But the new generation of guys, the rest, like the guys that are training and watching this or watching Nigel's documentary, hopefully will take away from it more than what we can because of how we've, al we've already been for the last 10, 12 years. They're just starting. They have the ability to say no. And don't be afraid to say no to a promoter that wants you to cut yourself because that's... I know bullshit. I have. Yeah. I have too. Uh, What's the reaction when you tell them now? Uh, they just yeah. That's the look right there. Yeah, you know? <laughs> there, there's there's two basic looks you're gonna get from promoters when you don't you piss them off. It's either the or if you try to say something, you explain to them, and they don't really get it. They go, yeah. <laughs> Those are the two main reactions you get. But uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, you know it's. They don't like it because you know I I and a lot of these promoters that want you to do it are the guys that this is the biggest thing that's ever happened to them in their entire life. Like they're running the show, they're the man. This is their hour of power, man. This is live Budokan for them. So like they have these grandiose visions and this, that, and the other. And uh, the guy that first asked me to blade was um, to remember that guy out in L.A. that um, he was going to run that show. And he bought a brand new six sided arena. He wanted to run in that big rodeo arena and drew like twenty people. Uh, like I had pyro my entrance. It was, I'm not aware of this at all. Yeah. Pyro, that's yeah, there, awesome. and, and, yeah, I, oh, I had Pyro. Chris Daniels on the show, and they wanted me to do the Chris main Daniels event. Chris Daniels wrestle uh, that tall dude, Aaron Aguilera. Is that the show that was on? You know what? It may have been, actually. It may have been. And the, yeah. it's the last thing that happened, they wanted me to blade and then get beat up and thrown in the back of a Cadillac and get drove off. So and I was like, well, uh, uh, I, 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 I have hemophilia. I can't do it. He was like, he was just, he was destroyed. And then his show, he literally... <laughs> Like drew like twenty people and he was just crushed. You know what I mean? And uh, I drew twenty people. It was out in L.A. Davey won't even bleed for me. Yeah, no, no way, man. You know, we're in a rodeo arena. You know what I mean? They put the tarps down. You know, like, 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 like some cow shit. That's beautiful. You know, yeah. or you know, bulls or anything. No, I ain't doing this. Man. Sorry, brother, man. No, so yeah. I mean, just I, I haven't been asked too much. Uh, it was outlawed in New Japan, so that wasn't a big deal. And then. I've never been asked in Ring of Honor. Uh, never been asked in PWG. It's especially silly now because everybody knows what WWE does when somebody bleeds now. So you're not going to impress anybody that you want to impress by look how much blood I can fucking draw out of my own head. Ah. Vince, where's the contract, buddy? You know? So. No. Um, no way. No thank you. How do you think, uh, and you tipped us off to this, I guess you kind of knew he was in discussions. How do you think Generico's going to do in WWE? Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows, but this is the thing. You literally, that answer is valid for every single person who signs a contract. Yeah. You don't know. But you can anticipate. Know. I mean, a guy like the only guy, Tyler, you could say, you know what? He was built the right way. See, even right Tyler, way. I didn't know because really? you never know who you, like those dudes all have different, uh, 
minds all have different characters, all have yep. different opinions, and you never know who they're gonna piss I, off. I, I think what he's saying though is like based on like past, oh, just talent know, and on, stuff. On, on past yeah, if you yeah, base yourself on the talent and where he's like, just what you know he can do, he should be a millionaire one day. But is that I true? Mean, like, you, like, you don't know. It, There's so it, many factors. Yeah, it's 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 definitely it. the only guy I knew when signed that I knew for sure would have talent, like would just make money and be a, like I, Claudio, like. Yeah, he got signed once and got released. I don't know what the fuck happened there, but when he got signed again, there was no way that dude wasn't gonna be incredible. Yeah. And now he's the best thing in professional wrestling. So, yeah, that's and awesome. it, it's one of those things where, like, you know, like judging by uh, Generico's like ability, yeah, by far and away, that is yeah. incredible. But if like, no outside that, factors that means affect so it. little sometimes. Exactly. So yeah, that, that's, that's, that, that's, that's what I was gonna say that's next. It. That's what I was gonna say next is like, well, if you look at his body, though, he's going nowhere fast. But at the same time, I mean, Brian never had a great body, you know what I mean? And look at Brian, you know what I mean? So, There's I mean, also Generico can work on that. And yeah, like, exactly. Uh, for example, uh, Pac, who got signed, the, the, the first time I saw Pac was in 2006 in England. And when I saw him, I re sorry, I wrestled him. And I, when we came to the back, I told him, okay, you're amazing. Like, you're incredible. If you get self-confidence, nothing will stop you. And it took him a long time, but he got self-confidence. Yeah. Through Generico... Through me helping him, through him going to Japan and realizing that, oh, hey, they really like me. And then going to the States and stealing the show. And just, he he got so much confidence from yeah. all wrestling, like working with wrestlers like all of us, telling him, hey, you're really good. And then I always, I'll remember this. I, uh, it was last year, Resistance Pro in Chicago. <clears throat> him and Generico were wrestling. And uh, they've wrestled each other a million times. But I hadn't seen them because they wrestled all over the world. I hadn't seen them wrestle each other in a long time. I hadn't seen Pac wrestle in a long time. Their opening spot, Pac, just what he did, obviously he's crisp, he's, uh, he's perfect. He, he's got perfect execution. And he was in there with Generico, who also does. When the spot ended, Pac stood up, and the fucking the way he was standing, just the aura that was, he was giving off, he was a WWE main eventer. You understand what I mean? Like, that was like, in my mind, I was like... <laughs> When he gets signed, he's gonna be gigantic. He's gonna be huge, mm -hmm. but maybe he won't. And now he's signed, and um, I'm assuming he's like now he's tag team champion in NXT. I'm assuming he's gonna move up relatively soon, but who knows? Tyler was champion for two years. He has all the tools to be amazing, but who knows what they're but like who knows what they're gonna, what they're gonna give him or what they're gonna saddle him with, you know? But again, these days it seems like they're doing a lot better with that and they trust wrestlers to be wrestlers. Seems like like yeah. things are changing over there too, so who knows? If they let like it's like I said, if they let those guys be what they can be, then I don't see why any of them, any of the guys who got signed from Hero to Claudio to Tyler to Generico to Pac, I don't know why any of those dudes wouldn't make a lot of money and be very successful for a very long time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's it. Let's go uh, into some of the questions we got from fans, and I almost want to apologize for some of these because some of these yeah, I'm looking I, uh, through the door here. But this is gonna be such a culture shock for me because yeah. I went on Twitter and I said we're recording this with high spots, me and Davey. So if you guys have questions, send them the high spots, and uh, we'll try to answer them. Uh, so. and being said, I, sure I, I, I cut some of these out because. I figured it'd be wasting everybody's time. And some of these may still be wasting some of right, our time. Let's, do it. let's go ahead. During your feud with Generico in 2010, was the chair that he finished you off with in 2010 the exact yes. same chair that you hit him with the year prior? Yes. So you, did you set it aside and use it? It was the chair that, um, it was the same chair that he hit me with, that I hit him with. It was the same chair that I, uh, like, I, I had the shirt with his head ripped off. Like, they made a shirt of, uh, it's it was his head, his mask, and it, his head is in the mask. Basically, like I ripped off his head and I put it on a chair. So uh, that was the shirt. And in September we did a double chains match, and I, I I stole his mask, and I recreated that image. Obviously, his head wasn't in the mask because I guess that was kind of hard to do. I don't know. So it was only the mask in the on the chair. That was the same chair that I used on him originally, and that ma that's the chair that I also like. I, I recreated it, and I used Steve Carino's blood to write my name on the chair, just like it's the T-shirt. And then that chair is the one that took me out of Final Battle too. So I'd like to also thank Shane Hagedorn, because he's the one who kept track of that chair through that year. He just made sure that he had it and that it was going to be ready for us. So, Question for Davey. Would you be down to face New Jack in a dream match? <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, he's... Uh... 
Right, I mean, my feelings, I've had a very nice guy. Can Sonny be the special referee? <laughs> <laughs> she sure can. Beats can be the special referee. <laughs> Uh, I had a question about Jim Cornette. I know we talked about him. I just, <coughs> you just want to give a quick answer. How different or similar were, were your guys' relationship with Jim while he was a booker? I actually think they were kind of similar in that we, uh, I mean, I didn't, like, I know Davey didn't deal with him a lot. I mean, no. he would do what he has got to do. I wouldn't de deal with him a ton either, but when we did deal with each other, I would uh, disagree with a lot of what we'd say, but kind of just say, yeah, okay, and then kind of just do my own thing, which I think maybe you kind of did too. You, you, know. you kind of learn how to work around, weave your way through Jim's world. That's a great way of saying it too, and even Lance Storm. I remember talking to Lance Storm about how like working with Jim is because he worked for him in Smoky Mountain, and he told me that exact. Like, you got to learn how to work with Jim. There's a way to it. There's a method yeah. to his madness in a way. He, so. he definitely means well, but he's definitely completely convinced of his views. And you just kind of, you know, you, you, you do what you got to do. I went to Japan all the time. That's what I did. So. Question just for Davey. What was it like turning sleazy with Kyle and Joey Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. This is footage we have. So yeah, just, no, no. Uh, man, I, you know, uh, for uh, maybe I'm unrealistic about this. I think people are completely sick of seeing me doing the matches that I do and having the, the matches that I have, and so I'd love to do something like that. And it was so much fun. And uh, I don't think they're sick of seeing you do them all the time, but I think it's extremely refreshing to see you do something else. Yeah, and and for, and I know that's true because I'm that you, that you say that and I'm thinking it. You know, what I mean, it's fun, and that's the thing about me in wrestling is like it, it becomes. The last dealing with the Ring of Honor wrestling wasn't fun for a really long time, and doing things like that reminds me that like it, it's good for me to just go out. I, I need to learn to be like Kevin in the sense of, like just go out and have fun and like you know I'm at the, still the mindset of like I'm, if I'm not the best I don't want to do this anymore. So that would be great. I'd love to do that should, more. Dude. And it was it's fun. The I, best. Tell, tell Ring of Honor to book this. I will. I when will. you see, I want to turn Team Ambition into Team Ambition. <laughs> right, that was my idea. But, it, but yeah, but yes, and it would have been sweet. And I can just hump everything in the ring, which I do. And when you have fun, dude, people see you have fun. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and like, and that's good for me because I'm a ball of stress. So I would love to. So I, I hope to do it again. My favorite Davy Richards spot throughout the years that I've seen, I've seen countless of his matches, incredible matches against Brian Danielson, Kenta, uh, just so many classics. Favorite spot, I forget on who. Uh, he put the guy in the tree of woe, went to the other corner, all intense, fucking drooling, sweaty, runs really fast, like he stops, and taps him in the dick. <laughs> and then, does this. Yeah. <laughs> Best spot ever. Yeah. We need to bring that back. I would love to. I, I would, You're uh, doing it tonight. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Which wrestler currently performing in the Indies do you think deserves a shot in Ring of Honor? Oh, jeez. Um, that's a really good question. Boy, it did narrow it down. Well, yeah, I'm only gonna let you pick one. I like, um, I think, uh, look, well, the Super Smash Brothers should, but they have, and it just kind of didn't go anywhere. Uh, and I also think uh, 2.0, who Chikara refers to as 3.0, who I refer to as 2.0, because I know them as 2.0, should also get a real shot in that they've gotten a match like last year, but you know. They knew it was going to be a one shot. Ring of Honor knew it was going to be one shot, but I think they could do well. And those guys come, you know, to mind right now for me because I, I know them personally. I spend time with them. Uh, but as far as like, you know, on the U.S. Indies, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, it's it sucks, but nobody jumps out. Yeah, nobody jumps out. I actually, and it's going to seem weird because he's he's sitting there. But I think Grizzly Redwood and Jake Manning should get a shot as a tag team. Yeah, that'd be Not cool. Not just in Ring of Honor, but anywhere. Like, uh, promotions should use them as a tag team because I've seen their stuff and it's really good. But besides, God, I, in a way, there's a lot of guys. Yeah. Just nobody's jumping out more than somebody, like other guys, I think. Uh, I'd say Shane Hollister from Chicago. I think he's really good. Um, I think... I can only do one. Yeah, I guess Shane. But he's got. I said like seven. So yeah, I uh, think Chase Owens from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee area is really good. Um, I think um, who's those guys from Georgia? You know, like like Kyle Matthews. Those guys. I don't know any of those oh, guys. Like he he's really good. That's another thing. You just name names that I'm not even aware. Yeah, of. Yeah, right. And yeah, you're talking about two point oh, three I don't. Yeah, exactly. I don't know twenty three point oh. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Do you think the uh, the indie roster is kind of thin? I mean, with all the oh, top guys going to WWE recently. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 
the landscape is very different. And uh, you know what it is, is, and this is gonna sound arrogant, may piss some people off. Not arrogant, but no, I do all the time. Don't worry about no, it. No, but I'm not even putting myself over. What I'm saying is, what I think it is is, um, there's a lack of places where guys can become something. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. When Generico and I came up, we were really lucky because CZW still mattered. And I'm sorry to people that still wrestle there, but I think a lot of people are, you know, pretty... Uh, they know that CZW isn't what it used to be in terms of not only, uh, like, uh, product, but actually the product's probably still pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of talented guys there. But as far as attention from the fans, yeah. they, it's just not the same. But when Generico and I started, CZW was still kind of hot. Like, people still went out of their way to watch it, and they still had good crowds. And then Jersey All-Pro, yeah. which I don't think was ever huge, but, you know, we went to wrestle there, and there, there was, like, a thousand people there. And, you know, and people would talk about those shows, and people would talk about the guys on the shows, and that's what helped us a lot. And then PWG brought us out, and people would talk about PWG. And now I find it's just not like that anymore. Like, there's Ring of Honor, there's PWG, and there's DG USA, but I find people don't really pay attention. Again, I apologize, and God, I may get an email or two about this, but I don't think people pay attention to DG USA as much as they do Ring of Honor or, or PWG. But I feel like now there's a whole bunch of DG USA guys that are booked on PWG for the next All Star weekend. And I think once they rock it there, they would automatically be a bigger deal. And then when they wrestle at DG USA, people are gonna pay more attention because those guys rocked it in PWG. Yeah, and the reason and the reason is because he's this this indie contract thing is absolutely ridiculous. Well, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, because it, it, it's it's like you know like like you're we're on, we're on the independence to get. I mean, I guess depending on how you look at Ring of Honor, not the independence anymore, but whatever. But it's still an indie because we get to work wherever. Yeah, well, I'm just saying just because the contracts all between mm-hmm. that, but like. But like something like DG USA and like you follow having contracts is the absolute stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my entire life because all you're doing is, all you're doing is Gabe can go can go to sleep a little bit easier at night knowing that his talents are gonna work elsewhere. But for these guys, they do work that- elsewhere. They just don't work in Ring of Honor. Let's be honest; those are the points of those contracts. Uh, for Ring of Honor, wait, I know a point of that. But the like thing for is- Dragon Gate, the point is you like he even lets guys if they want they he'll give them a release to go to WWE. But he's not going to give them a release to go work for Ring of Honor because he doesn't want this guy to work TNA. for Ring of Honor. Yeah. I don't know about TNA if he... You can't get a release from Okay. TNA. But the, and Ring of Honor is different. You've got a contract with Ring of Honor, you can't go to WWE or TNA because we're on TV, we're, we're putting TV time in you, so that's another story. Yeah, I know, but I'm speaking to the guys on the indies, like, you know, and, like, all these shows, and let's be honest, every show now wants to do an eye pay-per-view. Yeah. It, it just, it, it deregulates these guys from being able to do this, you know what I mean? And that's how, you, like, you get that hype. I mean, imagine if these guys could do, all, and, and these guys will go when they're hungry, they're going to perform every show they go to, but now they can't because they just do this one show. What happens if I'm not a fan of that show? You know, I go to CZW and I want to see you on their eye pay per view. It, it'd be better for the younger guys, is all I'm saying, to go and be able to get that exposure everywhere and then build up that name. You know what I mean? That would be better for the business as a whole. I don't think and, that. And, and not to interrupt you, but, yeah, but but even like tonight, we're, you know, by the time a lot of people see this, this, this thing's over. But mm-hmm. we're doing an eye pay per view tonight. We had to get permission from Ring of Honor, and it's very rare when they give you permission. They don't want everybody to have it. They don't want to go against anything. Right. So for a group like us, that's not. Ring of Honor, that's not PWG. We bring in guys like you to to give the rub. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do that through iPay-Per-View, it's kind of hard for any of these other groups to be yeah, made. Yeah, that's true. And that's just and that's just and that's just a seriously a case of like the business uh, evolving and and maybe men, people's like mentality not catching up just yet. You know what I mean? Like there's got to be some kind of common ground where it's like. You can use these guys. You know, I mean, I understand Ring of Honor is like we have to protect our investment. And you should want to see these guys on our TV and our eye reviews. I get that, but I'm just saying, like for like, but we're also owned by a national conglomerate. You know, what I mean, whereas like CZW, they, they are the very definition of an indie. DJ USA indie. You know, evolved indie. You know, what yeah. I mean, I mean, like you said, who the question is, who should get a shot in Ring of Honor that you asked earlier? I think AR Fox, Ricochet, Johnny Gargano, and all those dudes. So many of them should be working in Ring of Honor. Yeah, absolutely. But they won't be able to because they've. They, they have contracts with Dragon Gate USA, which the contract is there. I don't think those contracts keep them from working any other iPay-Per-View except Ring of Honor. Yeah. So, but which I mean, is, there's a lot of guys. Them, though. I mean, it is, but that's they make their but choice. your contracts yeah, yeah. are even worse. You, t- you guys technically can't work iPay-Per-View. 
Technically, yes. However, like you said, we could get permission if if they want to, and also. But you don't think if like uh, somebody who wanted to bring you in was they consider them a threat? You think they'd let you appear on the show? Of course not. Probably not. But the difference is, Ring of Honor pays me way more than any of those dudes are getting paid to do that, sure. like those shows. So there's an incentive there. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I still think it would be great if anybody could just work wherever they want and have fun and make as much money as they can because nobody is paying us enough to make a, a great living. But that's just not the reality of it. And like you say, they're dumb. It's true. I guess indie wrestling contracts are dumb, but I also understand the concept. I understand it. I think just for, for the smaller indies, it plays much more in the promoter's favor than it does into the wrestler's favor. And they all, mean, do, all the contracts do. Yeah, sure. but, but, but that's why, you know, that has an, a negative effect on the business as a whole because you're losing these wrestlers are having less viability to become the next big thing the next the new hype thing the new guy you know what i mean yeah but like at the same time it's that. a good i mean look at pwg they benefit from that because uh all-star weekend's gonna have dudes from ring of honor wrestling dudes from that people associate with dg usa and those matches right. would not be able to happen anywhere yeah. else because if they let's say a pwx wanted to do one of those matches uh, well, maybe Ring of Honor would be like, well, no, you can't, you can't yeah. do that. Yeah, so so maybe the answer is partly the contracts, but partly maybe all these promotions should be running eye pay per views as well. So maybe PWG they, doesn't run eye pay per views. Yeah, and gets so maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle. Want. PWG's just the best. Fuck. It's so good. I've been there so long. I know. You need to come back. But anyway. PWG has a, a, a different situation than most. They've built mm -hmm. up an audience yeah, and they, they can, can survive based yes. on the live audience. And that's, you know, unfortunately, I mean, most groups can't. We can't. Yeah, that's true. That's Very true. true. Very true. All right, which iconic wrestler have each of you dreamt of facing? And I think you've answered this question before. I mean, uh, I, Shawn Michaels, because uh, I think he's the best wrestler ever. So who wouldn't want to wrestle Shawn Michaels? It'd be a thrill. But, you know, there's, like, the thing is, this question's so vague. Like, who wouldn't want to wrestle The Rock? Who wouldn't want to wrestle Steve Austin? Who wouldn't want to wrestle The Undertaker? Who wouldn't want to wrestle fucking Tony Kazina, you know? <laughs> no, but seriously. Everybody wants to wrestle those dudes, so I don't know. Especially like, Tony. Except for all the 13-year-old kids. I guess, I, I guess if the question is, uh, I don't know, man. Like, I think it'd be crazy to wrestle Bruiser Brody in his prime. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just because it'd be like, oh my god, what's gonna happen to me? So I think that's a more valid question than which iconic wrestler. All of them. I'd love to wrestle Hogan, even if he's 77 years old. I wanted it last year almost wrestled Kevin Nash, which who to me is an iconic wrestler. And that match would have fucking been terrible. But how oh God, it would have been so so much fun. You know, my opening spot was gonna be a poke to his chest, and then when he doesn't sell it, I don't get it. <laughs> you can't make shit up. Dave, you got anybody in mind? Uh I it's pretty obvious with me, Dynamite. Uh who? Who's that? Oh <laughs> he's this guy. I'll give you the DVD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? It's like nineteen ninety-five. Uh Check payable to Davey Richards. Uh, the uh, um, yeah, all the money goes to him. Man. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, a good deal. Uh, Dynamite. Uh, you know, like yeah, the standard guys, uh, Guerrero and Benoit. They're still alive. Yeah, there you go. Guys like that too. Be yeah, Bret person. Hart. I mean, yeah, it, it is. It's a very extremely redundant question. Owen Hart. Um, I guess like the guys I would like to wrestle that people wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't yeah, a better think question would to. be who do you want to wrestle that we would never thought ever. Uh, J Jimmy Snuka would have been awesome. I would have loved to have done a wrestle Jimmy Snuka. Um, I'd fucking pay money for somebody to make me wrestle Mantor. Mantor? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. J Jimmy Snuka. You're going to say that and we're going to find you booked at. Let's at do it. Well, I'm not going to pay money, but <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to pay you me money it, to money. do it. Both of you, uh, at some point on PWG commentary, yeah. have, uh, have said PWG is the best wrestling company. I just said it yeah. four and a half minutes ago. I know, but on commentary. Did Dude. you ever get any. You know, negative feedback from the office putting over PWG when you're... No. No. No, no I don't. Well, if they did, I would say, oh, you just, you got to watch the DVD. Then you'll you'll say the same thing. Yeah. And so. if it was for PWG, I wouldn't be in Ring of Honor. So Exactly. Same here. Yeah. I wouldn't be anywhere. Do you ever think Gabe and Ring of Honor will work together again? No. Nope. No. Why? Ego. Because they could have, and it didn't work out. For, because yeah, ego. ego. Just and I'm not saying that's that, what like, it comes down to. Ego is not even a negative thing. It's just it's a natural human thing. Ring of Honor was willing to do this. Gabe didn't want to do that. 
uh, Ring of Honor didn't understand why Gabe didn't want to do this, and yeah. Gabe had his reason. Yeah, and I, they ended up telling each other to go fuck themselves. Yeah, and I'm glad you, you know said what? that. That's I, I'm, just not, the way it is. I'm not saying Gabe. I'm not trying to put him in a negative light, having this ego, but I mean, like Gabe is is uh, Gabe has Gabe's way, his ideology, and he's gonna live and die by yeah. that. You know what I mean? And, and if you're not along for the ride, see ya. And in a way, that's all. That could be a positive. Just yeah, oh, absolutely. Negative, so. He's very comfortable with what he's doing, and he's very comfortable with who he is, so more power to him for that. Yeah, and just, you know, it's it's not going to mesh, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Who besides Steen is a uh, class clown backstage in Ring of Honor? Oh, uh, well, I had a great run of showing my dick to everyone. Um, that came up last night when we were driving back from the yeah. show. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm going to say me. Okay. Hey, you can disagree with me. I'm going to say me because I think I'm funny. Roddy and Eddie Edwards were talking about your, your new thing of just showing your dick lately. I haven't been a victim yet. Yeah, I, oh, you will. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's out now, though. No. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I think me. Yeah, I'm always goofing off. and. Uh, Are you? Oh, You're not yeah. goofing off to everybody. I haven't seen this. The, I haven't seen your penis yet, but... <laughs> You're, you're usually, see it tonight. you're usually, I don't know, man. I, I like, I, if I think of, let's say, the the TV tapings in Baltimore, because we're there at one o'clock and the show's at eight, so we're all fucking there in the same room, just <sighs> slugs, and then once in a while, I don't know, like I start live tweeting what people are doing to like, and then other people read it and laugh. But you're usually kind of off in your own corner, you're not really. Well, lately, I've been doing so much studying. Maybe. But... Yeah, yeah, that's but... true. That's a, yeah, you do study a lot. But uh, besides, uh... fuck, who else? Steve Carino always jokes around, but most of his jokes revolve around uh, raping or wanting to rape Adam Cole. <laughs> and uh, uh, I wouldn't say Roddy's a class clown, but Roddy's very loud and brash, so he's yeah, kind of yeah. all over your face all the time because that's yeah. who he is. And he's not necessarily trying to to make people laugh, but he's always kind of there's always something happening. And also, uh, Nigel McGuinness recently. Put on a little. Uh, oh yeah, you know, he brought Nigel. a guy to yeah, wrestler's yeah, yeah, court, yeah. and you know the whole point was to just entertain the guys during the yeah. afternoon. Yeah, yeah, Nigel. Like that, yeah, so. you're right. I'd say Nigel. And he does magic tricks to entertain us, which is always very appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. On the bonus features of the Nigel, they had you and Kenny King's little jujitsu confrontation. Really? Oh, did they? He put that on there, right? Yes, he did. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah, I mean that was another thing done just so that because we were fucking bored, and you know, Kenny yeah. King was. Kenny King cool would have guy. been a good answer, yeah. actually. Now he's not there anymore. Kenny's but, cool, man. Yeah, like he was Kenny. always. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna close it with this. I'm gonna. I've skipped over some. No, no, come on. We have really? plenty of time. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. What else we gotta do? We have to be at the show at six. Thoughts? Jake, what's wrong? <laughs> he's like, oh, shit, uh, it's 5:45. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right now, now that we've seen the time, right, last skip. question. Fuck it. Since you two are sitting here together, face to face, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are expecting a big confrontation. Side by side. Okay, side by side. If you could pick one thing that you'd change about the other guy, what would it be? Uh, I wish that you wouldn't miss so many shows that you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Because then, for some reason, and I will say this because of this, people ask me why you're not there. Like one time, and it's not, it's not, through, it's through no fault of yours, but like your flight got delayed once, and then remember you couldn't make that show in Toronto, and they kept trying to call you, but I guess your phone was off. So for some reason, they felt like they could, act, like they called me. Oh, yeah. Why is Davey not here? I don't fucking know. Yeah, right. And then, or I'll get emails. Like that's happened where I, hey, uh, Davey, they, Davey didn't make it to our show, and I literally, I didn't tell you. I don't, I don't tell you this because what would matter, but right, like, right. I never have a fucking answer. Right. But I mean, it's not something personal. It's just like. Right. Or if anything, the more accurate way of putting it was I wish that people wouldn't associate me to your travel woes. I don't know why they do. Just yeah. don't fucking ask me. To that don't guy, know. don't buy me a flight with a 30 minute connection time. There you go. <laughs> um, growing pains. Yeah, right. Growing pains. Um, you already know what I'm going to say. Cause I've been saying it. I wish you'd take better I'm care gonna, of yourself. You're going to hit the gym. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I, I eat better. Yeah, dude, because I work. You know, yeah, I love I mean, you. we've and, been you know, through your this. family. Yeah. And I met your family, and I want you to, uh, yeah, and that's what I want. And uh, I want you to, yeah, take better care of yourself because I worry about you. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that. I guess on a personal level, you should change uh, your mindset on wrestling, too. Yeah. Because no, you'd enjoy it more. Yeah. And then and that I would be good for agree everybody, with you. too. 100% agree with you.
He knows me so well. You gotta hug it out. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for, for yeah. sharing. And I know there were probably some people who thought this was gonna turn into a fist fight and everything, but really, well, they what it is. They should have if they thought, because I even said it when I, if they saw my interview with you guys, I said it. We called each other, we're fine. So. Yeah. yeah, and I, I like to end it just by saying that uh, I, uh, first and foremost, this guy's always been a friend. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, and, and as friendships go, it, it goes here and here and here. And I, you know, his his view on me as far as taking it too seriously and too personally is ex more true than he knows. Uh, but uh, I have a lot of respect for this guy. He's a very deserving champion, and it was my honor to drop the belt to him. And he's um, he's a, he's a, and I'll be the first to be a far better champion than I am. Uh, and that's and he'll disagree, and because that's how he is. But I won't uh, disagree. I'd say we're both really <laughs> good champions. Huh? Uh, but uh, uh. uh I was wrong on a lot of things I said, um, either from not having all the information or just acting out in anger and bitterness, and that's not what friends do. So uh, I'm glad we did this, and um, you know, and I'm, and I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I accept full responsibility, and I'm sorry. This is when I should have kissed them. <laughs> Two of the very best in the world. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Break.